Balance of Nature's Fruits and Veggies in a Capsule. It's a great product. And the one thing I, I like about it the most is that when you open the bottles, you can smell like the, the scent of the fruits and veggies. It's no genius thing to it. It's really just fruits and veggies, which everyone needs. And they kind of, you guys kind of put it in a way where you can take it easy and you can get it. And it's natural, and, and that's what I like about it. You know? I like the product, and uh, I've taken it, and, and it's, it's definitely made me feel a lot better. You know, I am a healthy person to begin with. Uh, but it's it's a it's definitely good prevention and uh, it's definitely gives me energy and I feel like it's a natural thing. I like it. I really do. For a limited time, use discount code TALK to receive a fifty percent discount on your first preferred whole health system and have it shipped to you free. Call one eight hundred two four six eight seven five one or go online to balanceofnature dot com. Again, use discount code TALK. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store hours every saturday night it's a show that engages the mind makes you think and maybe even challenge what you think you know hi i'm jeremy scott of into the paranormal where we talk about topics that are anything but mainstream somewhere between abnormal and paranormal bring an open mind and join us for into the paranormal live saturdays at 6 p.m pacific 9 p.m eastern on the fringe fm we told you weeknights on the Fringe FM are now even better. And we mean it. Do it live! Where else can you hear the best shows and the best talent? Kick off your evening with our newest host, Alex Exum, live at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 Eastern. Hang out with me, Joe Roop, on Lighting the Void at 9 Pacific, Midnight Eastern. Ryan Gable expands your mind on the secret teachings at Midnight Pacific, 3 a.m. Eastern. We're bringing the heat every single night. Fire it up. The Fringe FM. From Studio 303, it's the Stranger Than Fiction News, right here on The Fringe FM, bringing light to the stories that surround us. A Scottsdale, Arizona couple are scratching their heads after two mysterious objects fell from the sky and hit their cars early last Friday morning. Randy and Mary Long were driving in separate vehicles south along Scottsdale Road near the Loop 101 around 6.15 a.m. Friday when both their cars were hit by some sort of object. There was an explosion, said Randy Long. The glass roof of his Mercedes shattered when the object hit it. The two say they were traveling about 100 yards apart without any vehicles or pedestrians nearby. Scottsdale Police Department say they did not receive any calls for potential rock throwers either. All of a sudden, I heard a loud bang, said Mary. Her Lexus feared a bit better, receiving only a chip in the windshield. The two think a meteorite could be to blame. This story was posted at BendedReality.com. And a Colombian town enforces a curfew to protect young people from evil spirits spreading through WhatsApp. The mayor of a town in northern Colombia recently announced a curfew forbidding the transient and gathering of minors under the age of 17 in public places between 7 in the evening and 5 in the morning to protect them from evil spirits that have allegedly been spreading through the popular messaging app, WhatsApp. Since the beginning of the week, authorities in the Catholic town have reported at least 14 cases of teenagers exhibiting strange behavior, including threats of jumping off bridges, self-lacerations, convulsions, fainting, and unexplained changes in their voices. This story was reported at OddityCentral.com. And another black-winged humanoid observed near Rockford, Illinois. The witness is quoted as saying, I was standing on the deck in my backyard late one summer evening. It was August of 2004. I was stargazing, as I often do, when I was startled by the sudden furious barking of the neighbor's dogs. 
As I turned and looked towards the direction of the barking dogs, it was at that moment I saw an all-black, seven-foot-in-length man with huge bat-like wings flying across the park that borders along my backyard. It then descended to approximately five to six feet above the ground. It pulled or folded its wings in slightly and then glided along the paved path that runs through the park. It continued gliding through the easement between the two houses, disappearing from my sight. This story is posted at phantomsandmonsters.com. And time for this edition's fun fact. The blob of toothpaste that sits on your toothbrush actually has a name. It's called a nurdle. And that wraps it up for another edition of the Stranger Than Fiction News right here on the Fringe FM. I'm Vance Nesbitt, anchor and news sorcerer. The Fringe FM, that is the Fringe.fm, and our website is lightingthevoid.com. Tonight we're going to be discussing the out of body experience with guest Preston Dennett. And uh, we've been talking about this show for a while now. We've had Preston on a few times, and uh, every time at the end of the show, I've always asked him, man, we got to do that show about the out of body experience. So it's time. This is the night. Now, this one I believe in so much because I've done it myself. And I know that um, if you've never had this experience, if you've never had a out-of-body experience or a lucid dream or anything of that nature, I think you might actually learn how to do it tonight. This is real, folks. This really happens. And it's a heavy topic in the paranormal field today. Now, if you don't remember, I've discussed it quite a few times. The first out-of-body experience that I ever had was on my couch. And... Um, I did a lot of practice to figure it out after reading Robert Monroe's books, uh, really wanting to know how to do this. And so I did the methods, and I remember the first time I sat up on the couch thinking, well, it didn't work again, and turned around and saw myself sleeping, and uh, went outside, flew around for a little bit. I remember the super heightened sense of reality, the... Uh, kind of a buzzing feeling, so many things about it that I'll never forget. And it's actually hooked me ever since. Um, and I know more and more people are now interested in this topic. It is my favorite topic and I know it's yours too. So we're going to bring on Preston. Now, if you don't know who Preston is, I know some of you don't cause some of you are new, but Preston Dennett began investigating UFOs and the paranormal in 1986 when he discovered that his family, friends, and co-workers were having dramatic, unexplained encounters 
And since then, he has interviewed hundreds of witnesses and investigated a wide variety of paranormal phenomena. He is a field investigator for the Mutual UFO Network, a ghost hunter, a paranormal researcher, and the author of 21 books and more than 100 articles on UFOs and the paranormal. His articles have appeared in numerous magazines, including Fate, Atlantis Rising, MUFON UFO Journal, Nexus, Paranormal Magazine, UFO Magazine, Mysteries Magazine, Ufologist, and others. His writings have been translated into several different languages, including French, German, Portuguese, Russian, and Icelandic. He's appeared on numerous radio and television programs, including Midnight in the Desert with Art Bell, Coast to Coast with George Knapp, Exploring Unexplained Phenomena with Scott Colburn, and many others. He has, he's also been on Into the Paranormal. He's been on a lot of shows. He's appeared on Unsealed, uh, Deep Sea UFOs 1 and 2, UFO Hunters, and more. His research has been presented in the L.A. Times, the L.A. Daily News, the Dallas Morning News, and uh, several other newspapers. He's also taught classes on various paranormal subjects and lectures across the United States. He currently resides in Rosada, California, and uh, his website is PrestonDennett.Weebly.com. And I got the book out of out of body exploring a beginner's approach. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Preston, thank you so much for coming back on the show. Hey, Joe, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, this is uh, this is the one, man. This is the one that we've been wanting. Well, I've been wanting to do for a while <laughs> here, you know. Um, yeah, we I, talk- I love this topic. Yeah, we've mm-hmm. talked about UFOs and Most of the time you've been on the show, we've talked about UFOs and abduction experiences. And every show we would talk a little bit about the out-of-body experience. And I thought, well, this time we got to do it, you know. And so I got your book and I started reading it. And what shocked me was what got you into it. And, you know, I won't speak for you, but it was after you learned that your mother passed away that got you into this. And I'll let you tell that story, but before you do that, did your mother passing away, did that get you into everything that you do now, UFOs, ufology, the paranormal, or were you into that before that happened? Um, You know, I really wasn't. I've always been been kind of philosophical, I guess, philosophically minded and wondering about the universe and science and all things like that. As far as the paranormal, no. Very skeptical, did not believe in ghosts, life after death, precognition, none of that stuff. Which is weird because, you know, age nine, I remember this vividly. I was watching a game show with my sister, a treasure hunt or something like this, where you have to guess, you know, what's inside these, you know, 100 boxes on the stage, Uh, you know, shortening it. And darned if I didn't know every darn answer on that show before they said it. And I'm telling my sister, I'm like, oh, you know, the, the check for 80000 it's in box you know, 79 or whatever it was. And it was. Could not believe it. We thought it was just the funniest thing. And looking back, I'm like, well, you know, that's clear-cut precognition at least. Uh, but we just kind of laughed it off. And I never really thought about it until, you know, years later when I started to get into this subject. There's there's um, some comments in the chat room, I think, that I can relate to, like Cynthia's putting here, that as far as the out-of-body experience or astral travel, that they really would like to do it. They really want to know how. And I think, you know, maybe tonight you you may not be able to get somebody to, to have their first experience, but you can definitely talk about how you went through yours, how you got to do your first experience. I know right. I know mine. I've talked about it a million times, but I do wonder about the struggles that you went through to get to that first out of body experience. Yeah, boy, if anyone takes away anything from this, you know, show listening to this tonight, I hope that they just at least try it. Uh I think one of the biggest obstacles is just skepticism. Fear is definitely another obstacle. Uh laziness, things like this. This this is what stops people from actually doing this. They don't believe they can, or they're just too darn afraid or not willing to try. But this is actually a natural human condition. Most people will have at least one, probably a couple, out-of-body experiences or very vivid, lucid dreams, flying dreams, things like this, uh, at least a few times in their life. 
So it's definitely something that everyone can do. It doesn't take any special qualifications, really just an interest in trying it. Uh, well, for me... No, go ahead. Sorry. I mean, for, for me, I mean, I, I never really thought about it. Didn't look into it. You know, and then it was in 1984. I'll, I remember vividly I was at home alone, which is really rare considering, you know, I'm one of six kids. And uh, our house was really pretty much always bustling with activity. But I was home alone on a Saturday morning when I got a phone call. And it was the worst news ever. My mom had died of a massive heart attack. This is in 1984. She was out of town. And uh, phew, I mean, my world ended at that point. I was 19 years old, really close to my mom. You know, kind of a young 19, really. Not super mature, really. Uh, so I just fell apart. I could not believe it. Is your first experience with someone that you cared about dying? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it had sort of skirted around me a few times, you know, for friends and stuff. But nothing like this that actually hit the family. And uh, I thought pretty much everyone in our family was skeptical and didn't believe in things like this, life after death or whatever. So it really devastated me because I thought, well, you know, that's it. She's gone forever. On some level, I just couldn't wrap my mind around that. And uh, almost immediately, I mean, weird things started to happen. I would say the first thing was, you know, we had her service not too far afterwards. Uh, and the car's driving up, my dad's driving, and darn if she wasn't sitting there in the front seat. And I thought, oh, God, you know, there's mom. Yeah. You know, she's dead. This is impossible. I really must be hallucinating. That was my first thought. Right. But I was really fascinated because she was 100% vivid, you know, not translucent, certainly, full color, sitting straight up like she always does, and got real close to me, gosh, four feet maybe, before she just faded away. I thought, well, you know, I must really be sad, which, you know, I, I was, I, but I wasn't like weeping <laughs> out of control or anything like this. I was just kind of stunned. Right. I'm sure if you went to a doctor, too, they would tell you that's normal. You're just hallucinating or whatever, you know. Right. N never taken hallucinogenics, you know. Never really had an experience like that. Looking back, you know, now knowing what I know, I feel like that was probably her ghost or her spirit. But it was following that, you know, about a year after she died, I guess, I started having really vivid dreams where she'd come into my room and I would wake up to see her standing there. I'm like, well, God, what are you doing here? You're dead. This is impossible. And she would just smile and look at me and kind of hold my hands or we'd hug. And then I would wake up for real. So these had like these false awakenings. That was really confusing because I was sure I was awake. Um, apparently I wasn't. And it happened over and over again to where I started to really you know, write these down. Because I knew on some level, I just knew this was her. I felt her. You know, I could. There's just something about the quality of a person's presence. Yeah. And uh, you just know. And I'm like, well, you know, there's no such thing as life after death. So this can't be real. But it is. Because I know it and I, it's happening. And how do I reconcile this? And so I started looking into dreams and lucid dreams, and that's how I kind of stumbled into the whole out-of-body thing, I was really picking up Robert Monroe's book, Fire Journeys, which is really one of the best books out there. Um, since then, I've got probably 50 books on this subject. I've read everything down to the historical books that are, you know, really expensive and hard to find, to, uh, you know, all of them pretty much that I can get my hands on. So you picked up his second book. Because that's his second book, I think, Far Journeys. Um, out of Body Journeys, that's the first one, huh? Yeah, the first yeah. one is Journeys Out of the Body, but yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's what I meant. Uh, the third book was really kind of hard to understand the first yeah. time I read it. I'm like, what is going on here? Um, you know, now I'm, I understand it a little better. 
But so I did his exercises. I mean, he had it in the end of the book, you know, here's how you do it. I thought, oh, you got to be crazy. You're kidding me. All right. You know, it was an interesting book. It was, you know, very sincere and certainly vivid. So I thought, oh, I'll try it. And if it works, you know, that'll be amazing. I don't think it will. I have to tell you, almost immediately, I'm going to say within the first week or two, I started having really vivid dreams, more false awakenings. Uh, took me about a month or two of five minutes of meditation, you know, a night, and it had my first out-of-body experience. I'll never forget it. Suddenly, I wake up in the middle of the night, and I'm like standing next to my bed thinking, oh, God, you know, I woke up. Where am I? What am I doing standing next to my bed? I'm a little confused and kind of shook my head and came to full awareness and realized that I was not, I mean, I was, geez, it was definitely confusing because I saw myself there in bed. I'm like, whoa, I must have died. I have died. I've gone and died. And I got this cold chill of death. That well, that's that's that. I'm done. Right. I'm done. And yeah. I had the just this mortal terror. I dived immediately back into my body and I felt really strange sensations of, you know, squeezing and twisting and c- curling around and woke up and I thought, "Oh, something just happened. What just happened?" And I remembered just barely really. Um, what had just happened? And I got so excited. I'm like, oh my God, I know what just happened. I just went out of body. I did it. I actually freaking did it. Couldn't believe it. And uh, that was my first one. I uh, never looked back really after that. Yeah. And I think uh, what a lot of people uh, want to know, Preston, is what it takes to do that. Now, keep in mind uh, in the book, you know, Preston skipping over a lot of the stuff that he had, that he went through, um, to get to that point, which I went through too. But in the book, you talk about how, you know, you have to have, uh, an obsession almost to get this done, or at least you did. And I remember the first time I had mine, that's how it was for me too. It's all I wanted to do. You know, um, it's all I thought about. And eventually it happened. It doesn't really happen as much anymore because I don't obsess about it. But do you think that has something to do with it? Like almost an obsession like uh, vigor to get this done. Yeah, you have to really focus. It has to become your priority. I mean, it doesn't have to. I've talked to people who are like, oh, yeah, just laid down and I did it. <laughs> you know, right. Other people have a real steep learning curve. You know, it can take, you know, months, years. Uh, I think each person is different. Uh, I've taught a lot of people how to do it. It's not hard by any means. I think it just kind of takes the right conditions. And uh, absolutely, the more energy you can put towards this, the more focus, the more time, the more desire, the more you can really put everything you've got into it, your imagination, your intention, your desire, your focus, all of it, um, you'll be more successful that way. Uh, but for, for me in the beginning, it just, I was so excited. I had so much excitement about it that I think that's what really worked for me. Yeah. So I, I get, I totally get that. This thing is, um, I think it was trippy about it is in the book. You talked about the false awakenings and I've had that, that heavy feeling you get that most people have felt that when they've uh right before they fall asleep if they're still awake they feel heavy or paralyzed what it is is your body you know your body's totally relaxed and eventually i think your brain just shuts off everything to the body and you just feel stuck or heavy but that's exactly what it is yeah but there's a few terrifying moments (laughs) in the in that space uh when you are either trying to get out of the body and it's almost you're so close between sleep and awake that you, it's almost like you have to go to sleep, which is kind of scary to me anyways, or, or you got to wake up, which is hard or you get out of the body. Um, so you know what I'm talking about? It's hard to explain, right? But you don't want to go to sleep because this is your only chance. And you know, if you go completely (laughs) unconscious, you know, you're just, 
you're going to have to try again. Uh, it's a very yeah. freaky moment. It, it, well, that's sleep paralysis. And uh, definitely is a good sign, really, that you're on the right track. When you're doing this, the, the first step is to physically relax. And can't emphasize it enough. This is probably where most people um, fail, to, is to relax fully. Uh, so you really have to go through a process. It can take up to 20 minutes to, to completely relax. And you know you can always relax a little more. And that's kind of the secret is just <laughs> relaxing and then relax again and then kind of let go. At some point, you do want to stop thinking about your body and sort of turn inwards or focus your attention elsewhere, not on your environment so much, uh, because that can you know, keep you glued to it. But you want to get to the point where you're so relaxed that you start to feel one of a number of sensations. And it can be any of these, such as... Uh, dizziness, vertigo, heaviness, lightness, uh, num numbness or tingling, uh, itching can definitely <laughs> sweep across your body. Hmm. Uh, all kinds of things, extreme thirst, uh, a little, maybe even a slight choking sensation. Uh, really what you want to get to is what's called the vibratory state. And that's where you feel sort of an electric shock. It can be mild or it can be really intense. It can sound like a jet engine right in front of you or just this really kind of intense buzzing that radiates through your entire body. And what you're feeling there is you're going up a vibration. You're just kind of pressing up against the astral realms and getting in touch with your astral body and you're transferring your consciousness from the physical realm into the astral. And it's a really kind of a buzzing feeling. And when you're feeling that heaviness, it's because your body is releasing a chemical that renders you paralyzed while you're in the dream state. This is to prevent you from basically sleepwalking and acting out your dreams. And if you're conscious through it, it can be a little scary and you start to move and you try to move and you can't, you're paralyzed <laughs> yeah, and you're thoughts you know your thoughts can start to manifest around you so this is where people have like you know think they're somewhere else you know or, or uh, they'll sense creatures around them monsters uh things like this because you know at some point if you start to get scared you're gonna start projecting that so there's a lot of confusion about you know it's what is sleep paralysis is this related to out of body stuff certainly it is um, abductions, that's been brought up. Oh, that's sleep paralysis. No, it's a separate phenomenon. Uh, but it's definitely a good sign that you're physically primed to take the next step, which is mentally relaxing. And uh, I don't think people realize it, but they're dreaming all the time. At night we dream, we all dream. You might not remember it, but you are definitely dreaming. And when you wake up, you're still dreaming. You're in that, you have what's called the stream of consciousness. And when you go to bed at night, the stream of consciousness manifests into images and sounds and you kind of fall into it and you create these storylines, these dreams. Mm. Most dreams are about, you know, 80% fears and desires and sort of wacky. Right. What you saw that day. But if you can break through that, pull away from it, this is when you start to have precognitive dreams, lucid dreams, out-of-body experiences. So it's really a matter of mentally relaxing and allowing yourself to just maybe not stop this stream of thoughts because that's really you know difficult, but certainly step away from it and not identify with it so deeply and just right. kind of watch, watch it go by. You know, Watch these thoughts go by. You want to get to the point where... Your thoughts start to uh, manifest in right. images, and you can see them, and you can hear them. And then you know, you're like, wow, okay, you're, you're physically relaxed now, you're mentally relaxed. You can move to the third step, which is basically, you know, these, these are my own that I've kind of refined from other books and my own experience. The third step is uh, visualizations and affirmations. Right. What's well, up? Uh... Let's let's hold it right there. We got to 
take our break here but this is good stuff this is what you guys want to know preston is talking to you about the stuff you're going to go through to have your first out of body experience so we're at the third step uh we'll be right back after these words to Lighting the Void Radio. The truth is out there. There's something out here. And so are we. KTOK Digital Broadcasting, The Fringe FM. Do you ever wonder why there's so much show in politics? Do you ever wonder why America's not getting fixed? Ever wonder why our media is not reporting the news? They report only their biased opinion. Are you tired of feeling like a controlled rat? Do you wonder what's next? If you're looking for answers, join me, Ronnie McMullen, for my new show, Deep Waters Radio. That's Deep Waters Radio. Monday nights, 9 p.m. Pacific, right here on The Fringe FM. Hi, this is Aaron Hunter, host of Real Paranormal Activity, the podcast where we tell real paranormal experiences of people from around the world. And we also conduct interviews with authors, investigators, psychics, and mediums. Real people, real stories, real fear. Thursdays at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern on The Fringe FM. See you then. Balance of Nature's Fruits and Veggies in a Capsule. It's a great product. And the one thing I, I like about it the most is that when you open the bottles, you can smell like the, the scent of the fruits and veggies. It's no genius thing to it. It's really just fruits and veggies, which everyone needs. And they kind of, you guys kind of put it in a way where you can take it easy and you can get it and it's natural. And, and that's what I like about it. You know, I like the product and, uh, I've taken it, and, and it's, it's definitely made me feel a lot better. You know, I am a healthy person to begin with, uh, but it's it's a, it's definitely good prevention, and uh, it's definitely gives me energy, and I feel like it's a natural thing. I like it. I really do. For a limited time, use discount code TALK to receive a 50% discount on your first preferred whole health system and have it shipped to you free. Call 1-800-246-8751 or go online to balanceofnature.com. Again, use discount code TALK. When I'm done running with the wolves after hunting down a half-ton bison, I look forward to a mind-teetering escapade evening on The Fringe FM. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Folks, this is very important information. What's to be said about CBD? AncientLifeOil.com Our CBD is made from hemp and has .003 THC, which means this wonderful product won't get you high. No matter what amount you take, what does CBD do for the body? My hands are tied. But you can Google CBD benefits and be astounded. When you're finished reading, you'll want to log on to AncientLifeOil.com That's AncientLifeOil.com and purchase. Life is good when you feel good. People are tired of pain. People are asking for non-GMO organic products to help them with, <laughs> you fill in the blank. Legal in 49 states, and again, our CBD is made from hemp. Ancient Life Oil is about helping people one by one by one. If you wonder how good the product is, the CEO takes it every day without miss. AncientLifeOil.com. That's AncientLifeOil.com. Have a great day. Howdy, this is Catalina, and you're listening to Lighting the Void with Joe Roop. All right, welcome back. We're here with Preston Bennett. This is Lighting the Void. We're talking about exploring the astral realm, uh, astral travel with Preston Bennett, and his book, Out of Body Exploring a Beginner's Guide. This is uh, an awesome subject. Everybody loves this subject. But I think the big thing is is that people want to know how to do it. And um, 
you know, we did kind of gloss over some things, but I think what you're saying, Preston, is the most important thing here is to relax, you know, and I mean relax all the way, uh, get to a point to where you can just relax as much as possible and then get to that, you know, paralysis state. And then hopefully you'll get to the vibratory state, which I know a lot of people have gotten to that point. Um, but you were at step three. If you have any advice from that point, uh, that would be great. But we left off at step three before the break there. All right. Well, I'm sure people have felt a lot of these sensations. You you know, when you're like lying there in bed and something, you're like jerk and you're like, feels like you're like thrown into your bed kind of, or, um, that's definitely part of all of this. Uh, and again, you know, this is something that is, everyone is doing every night. This is something that's happening to everybody. They're just not remembering it. A lot of dreams are half-remembered, sort of -of out-of-body exploring. This is according to most of the people who are doing this, and I totally agree. Uh, Not everyone agrees that everyone has out-of-body experiences. There's a few guys who said, no, you know, we just kind of hover above our body at night. But I'm like, no, I don't think so, (laughs) because, you know, I've seen my brothers and sisters on the other side, and they're still alive. Uh, we're all out there. Every you mean night. you've seen them out of their body while you were out of body? Right. Okay. Wow. And so, and other people, you know, who are living and dead. So it's a natural part of the human condition. The problem is we're so caught up in the physical world that we're basically shutting out one third of our life. We're not taking the effort to really connect that. And it's utterly possible to completely remember everything that happens to you at night. It's really important to keep it, we'll call it a dream journal, but it's really just a journal of your nighttime experiences, which are absolutely as real as your so-called waking experiences, especially if you can bring your waking consciousness into them. And not only are they as real, they're more real. It's much more vivid, much, there's a hyper-realism kind of that's hard to describe to an out-of-body experience i got uh, i know but, exactly what you're talking the one time that i know that i had it the one time i got really excited I, that's the one thing that i remember about it preston is that it was so real it was realer i don't even know how to explain it it was realer than real yeah colors are a little more vivid You know, and, you know, if you go up to the higher realms, I started to realize, like, why is this so darn different, but kind of the same? It's all made of light. It's glowing. And there's an inner vitality to it that isn't as pronounced as it is down, you know, down here as it is up there. Uh, So, but going back to the third step, right? So physically relax as much as you can. This is one of the methods. You know, there's other methods you can do throughout the day keeping a dream journal is definitely part of it but there are methods we'll talk about that you can do throughout the day that are work really just as good as you know these three steps which is physically relaxing mentally relaxing and then we do what's called visualizations or affirmations and there's a bunch of these as far as affirmations what you want to sort of do is set your intention to remember what happens to you at night Tell yourself, right now, I am out of body. I am going out of body tonight. You know, appeal to your spirit guides. Tell yourself you deserve to go out of body. You really want to affirm that this is going to happen. You intend it, you imagine it, and uh, affirm it is with all your willpower. You really want to summon, summon up your willpower. Say, this is going to happen because I want it and I deserve it. And then what you do is visualizations. And there's a bunch of them, and I have to tell you, I've tried pretty much everyone on the list. There's all these different sort of visualizations you can use that will lift you right out of your body. And some work really well. Others are a little more difficult. Probably the easiest ones, in my opinion, are uh, ones involving movement. And that is usually like a, a good example would be to imagine yourself running, just jogging down a pathway. Another would be to like roll out of bed, roll back and forth until you um, roll out of bed. I do that. I do that one 
probably the most just because I've gotten used to it. Uh, but there's so many. Uh, standing on the bow of a boat, imagining it going up and down, an escalator going up. Imagine yourself on an elevator. You know, imagine yourself holding balloons and they're floating you up. Uh, anything really involving movement will do it. Spinning. Does that take like, you into a dream state, though, when you do that? Well, yeah, it can. It absolutely can. Because if you're uh, not sufficiently mentally relaxed, you'll just go right into your dream. Uh, but not necessarily. I mean, if you, you know, there are ways to prevent that. Spinning is a good one. That pulls you right out and it kind of erases illusion a little bit. Just spin in place. And uh, it's pretty effective. These are, that, this is just one kind of main method involving movement. And uh, easy to do. Uh, another, if you're kind of uncomfortable with that, is to imagine a place you know really well. A childhood bedroom. Or you know, just a place that you're really comfortable with and you want to visit. And uh, imagine it. Imagine it as vividly as you can. And suddenly you'll see it and you'll step right into it. And it's mind blowing because you're like, wow, that just happened. <laughs> like, boom. Uh, so that's another method. And it works also just like that with a person, particularly if you want to go to the other side, say. Uh, but you can do this with a living person as well. Imagine that person. Call out to them. Imagine their voice saying your name. Really connect to their energy. And say, you want to visit them tonight, now. And that's where you're going. And don't let your attention stray from just them, you know. Uh, that works really well. Appeal to your spirit guides. Uh, I've learned, and this is, I think, affirmed by other out-of-body travelers, that you're pretty much accompanied by spirit guides while you're doing this. So they're going to be aware if, if you set out the intention that you want to do this and uh, they'll be able to help you. No, we, we all have multiple guides or do you think that help us with this? Well, yeah, of course we do. And I know the guides is probably the wrong word. They're just friends and family is what they are. People who have died, who are living on the other side, you have a much larger family on the other side than you do here. That's true for pretty much most people. Uh, so there are people who pretty much dedicate a lot of their time on the other side to helping out the people who are here. And each one has their ward, their charge, you know, that they're sort of looking out for. So, yeah, absolutely. We do have spirit guides mm. and it's nothing like really woo woo or spooky. It's just friends and family. Um, Joseph's got a good question in the speaker chat, which kind of goes back to what we were asking you earlier is, if you start imagining things and it takes you into a dream scenario, for instance, if I imagine that I'm standing on the, the bow of a boat, like Titanic or whatever, next thing you know, I'm in a dream. I'm on the bow of a boat. How do I right. get back to, for instance, how do I get back to not so far in the big higher realms, but maybe I just want to go look at my body or go back to that realm. Right. Well, what's, there's this thing called a lucid dream. And when you're lucid dreaming, you are essentially out of body. Some people think it's an inferior form. Some argue that it's actually superior, you know, that you're actually way out. Because when you are having a lucid dream, you're projecting a dream right. in front of you. It's not objective reality as we think of it. But the fact is, on the other side, when you do that, it is reality. It looks real and it experiences as real. Your brain really can't tell the difference. It certainly feels real. But to get out of it, there's a couple of things you can do. You can call out, erase illusion. That's never really worked for me. A couple of times it has. You can spin and this will cause the whole environment to sort of dissolve and you'll wake up and you'll realize, oh, you're actually hovering above your bed. That's happened to me a number of times. Uh, so that's a really good way. It's just spinning, kind of, like I mentioned before. Uh, that will erase the dream and put you wherever you are out of body. You mean like when we were kids and we used to stare up at the sky and twirl around or just spin in place, you know? Yeah, spin in place. 
it's kind of different when you're out of body because it, you start to go real fast. You, know, you can only go so uh, fast when you're, uh, you know, physical. Right. Okay. But, uh, yeah, I mean, this is an easy thing to do. The second time it happened to me, I just, you know, I was kind of depressed a little bit. And I was, it was daytime and I just went into my bedroom and I slumped down on my bed and I just lay there and I let go and I'm like, and relaxed. And suddenly, you know, I could have sworn I had put my finger in the wall socket because I felt this electricity running through me. Yeah. I'm trying, trying to figure out what's going on when it just whooshed out of my body noticed there was a, a person in my room i'm like wow well that's weird went across you know out of the room across the hallway into the bathroom and i grabbed the countertop and i'm looking in the mirror can't see myself sometimes you do sometimes you don't i uh, couldn't and i'm like whoa oh my god i'm doing that i'm i'm doing this i'm doing this i'm actually doing this yeah and i became so excited that i got pulled right back into my room and i was flying you know, floating horizontal, floating back and above my bed, slowly sank down on my body, felt this real strong vibration and woke up and, and felt amazing. I'm like, wow, okay, this is on. I am going to do this. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> how I felt the first time I did it. I was, it's like, this is real. This is real. You know, like I got to keep doing this for sure. Yeah. But so what, for it's me, hard I mean, to do it though. Like, here's the thing. I think, um, you don't stay out of body very long and that's, did you ever get past that? Yeah. And it was a long time of struggle. You know, well, we don't have really... to go down that, that road yet. I think some people still have some more questions, but that just popped in my mind because it seems like everything happened so quick and then you're just back in, you know? No, it started with a lot with dreams for me. There's, different techniques you can use. One technique you really want to use is when you have a dream, you want to look for what's called a cue. And, and most dreams will have this. The vast majority will have something that's just not right. Okay. It's not reality. You know, their driveway's facing the wrong way. This person has three eyes, you know, or something that's just not right in some manner. So, some overt signal that's pointing that this is actually you know, a dream. Okay. It, and uh, it's a cue. And if you can learn to recognize that and say, oh my God, this is a dream. You will suddenly, the dream will, you'll wake up within the dream and it will become much more vivid and sometimes fades away and you're back in your room. Well, what, yeah. Uh, what keeps you from waking yourself up though? Like for real, that's what that's I'm thinking. What, it's a little bit of a problem. It can get confusing. You know, I, I remember having dreams where people would be knocking at my bedroom door and I'd wake up in the middle oh, of the yeah. night and there's no one there. And like, Preston, wake up. Preston, wake up. And I'd wake up and I'm like, well, what is going on? Because <laughs> there's no one there. It's the middle of the night. And I knew what was going on. I was kind of, you know, even today, I don't sleep like I used to do. I really don't. Yeah, you know, when I'm. Either. I'm like lying there in bed, pretty much kind of awake for a good portion, not a good portion, but there's a portion of the night where I'm totally aware of what's going on. Well, I think that, uh, and, uh, you know, I'm not, I usually don't like to tell, give my advice when I have a guest on at all, you know, I'd rather the guest do it, but I would say like, I know where that's where some of you are getting at. I have a hard time just like, uh, you're asking Joseph. I don't want to get caught up in a dream, even though uh, I've talked to William Buellman and other people say, even Thomas Campbell, actually, they don't mind that because they can come back easier. But for me, it only really happened when I laid there and got super relaxed and attempted to roll out of my body. That's the only time that I knew that it really happened for real. Maybe a couple of other times, but that one time I know it happened. It was so super real. But I've also yeah. had that happen, Preston, where I've the second time that happened, I rolled out of my body and I ended up kind of fading into a dream. You know, not l leaving the dream to come back, but actually fading into a dream where something wasn't right. If that makes any sense. Sure. Yeah. I mean, Dreams are very connected to all of this. And uh, 
It's if you can remember like three, four, five dreams a night, boy, you are doing this because then you're starting to get to a point where you're really recalling what's going on at night. And dreams are, again, just that stream of consciousness mostly. If you can sort of face your fears and desires and learn to meditate, uh, you'll find that you, you become lucid a lot more easily. I think the, you really want that breakthrough, that first time you actually do it. Yeah. And once you do, then, you know, you're ready to kind of take the next step. But that first time can be hard for some people. Uh, and to really do it is just a matter of, you know, building up the dream state, trying to become lucid within the dream. And how you do that is recognizing these dream cues, saying that is not real. I must be dreaming. And so how to do this, and this works really well, is throughout the day, you look at everything around you and you look for anything that's, you know, out of place, something that can't be real. It's called, you know, critical thinking and reality testing. And uh, first you look around for anything that might indicate that this is actually your dreaming right now. You could be out of body. And t- take it seriously. And the way to really do it seriously is to do the permeability test. When you're out of body, you can walk through walls. You can move through any object. So you can take your finger and try to put it through your desk or your chair or whatever's next to you. And what will happen is you'll be doing this, you know, a couple of times a day, hopefully. The more you do it, the better. Sometimes you'll be doing it, and your finger will go right through your desk, and you'll realize, oh, I am out of body right now. It's mind-blowing when that happens, because you're like, oh, my God, you don't expect it. And this is the real problem. People are dreaming so vividly that they don't even consider the possibility that this is a dream, when in fact it is. So... This is a, it works so well. If people try any of the exercises, do this one critical thinking and reality testing. Another way to reality test is to try to fly, you fly very easily on the other side. And what'll happen is you'll, you know, try to throw something in the air and see if it floats. And it doesn't, it doesn't, of course, and it doesn't. And you'll do it several times and until suddenly it does. And when it does, it's the craziest thing you've ever seen. Because the world kind of fades away and you see that you're actually, you know, floating above your bed or outside in your backyard or above your house or on the other side even. It's a yeah, it's really a, effective method. I can't stop. Well. I can't stop thinking about the image in my head the first time that it happened. I don't know if you've seen that movie uh, Ghost with Patrick Swayze. You seen that one? Oh, yeah. Where they, uh, <clears throat> you know, when they those guys die and those demons come and take them away how they kind of peel out of their body, you know, I remember, (laughs) I remember doing that and thinking this isn't real. And I noticed in your book, uh, the out of body exploring a beginner's guide that in your, um, I guess the, your thank you part in the beginning of the book, you, you mentioned Samuel on right? Which is somebody that, you know, he's a Gnostic scholar, I guess. And I read his book, uh, dream yoga. Did you take any cues from him? I know you brought his name up, so I was thinking he, you know, Preston had to have re- read that book where he shows right. you how to do certain things that will help you, like try to go outside. Because I've told people about this, I would go outside in my yard and actually attempt to fly in real life. And I know I looked stupid, but it did help me with that first experience. Yeah, he's got some great ideas and talks a lot about this his whole thing was you can become enlightened through the out-of-body thing yeah he, he was experience. a spiritual thing for him so uh i and i was looking into every, anyone who was writing about this or teaching about it i actually went down and took some classes in hollywood with my sister and brother-in-law or my sister-in-law and uh, it was pretty interesting uh yeah it was from the I gnostics one of the interesting things he had was like, God, what do you call it? Mantras, uh-huh. which, which I'm not too keen on really because they're a little strange. But supposedly there's all these experiments that I read about certainly that you can do when you're out of body, like saying your name. Something amazing is supposed to happen. And I'm like, well, I'm going to do that. And uh, he had this mantra. I still remember it. It's like, 
uh, Rayom Geom Om Bor Bu Mama Papa. And I'm like, oh, okay, Mama Papa, really? Okay, <laughs> right. I'll, 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 I'll do it. You know, why not? And he says, if you can become lucid in the dream state and you say that, he said, it's the dynamite of the dream state. I'm like, all right, you know, that sounds like it's going to be really hard to do, but I'll give it a try. Darned if I didn't do it, and it was amazing every oh, time wow. I've done it. Every time I wrote, wrote about this, and uh, you know, he's like, "No, I won't tell you what happens, but you know, I'll tell you for me what happened the first time is uh, suddenly I remembered everything that happened that night. All like I had seven dreams, and they started playing out before me, and I could see them all vividly. I'm like, "Whoa, that's pretty and cool!" That, and every time I do that. You know, one time I said it over and over again, and I'm out of body, and I, and the whole house starts shaking like an earthquake, and I'm just calling the power, and I'm just doing it over and over, and it just brought this incredible level of vibration, that, and power. I don't, I mean, I don't even know how to describe it. It was amazing. So there's, uh, yeah, all kinds of things you can do these experiments. It's part of the fun of once you get good at it. There's all kinds of things you can do. So uh, Singh is asking, which is a good uh, question for good, while we're on this topic. Um, he wants to know if you've had any spiritual awakenings or if you've met anybody significant while you were doing this. Um, yeah, the whole thing has been incredibly spiritually awakening in a lot of ways. Um, definitely. I think that one of the things that really freaked me out was started to have a lot of precognition a lot of dreams which came true and that was amazing and you know telepathy even and clairvoyance and visions i remember one that was really vivid it was just crazy i'm going to the you know the bank atm machine and as i'm driving there i start to get this vision in my head of this crazy looking guy kind of a thug, you know, a huge biker looking guy with real long hair and he was swinging around like a whip, his hair. I'm like, well, this is a weird thing to see in my head and why is it making me nervous and what is going on? When I come around the corner and there he is right in front of the ATM machine. I'm like, all right, well, I'm not going over there. I can tell you that. And I stayed until he was gone. But it was just a very clear vision that I had and one of the you know first times it ha was happening I'm like wow you know you can see the future you can see things from a far distance away and what happens is when you do this you sort of loosen your bounds to time and space and you can visit the past and the future time flows differently on the other side and it's more easy to sort of access a wider range I guess than it is here yeah, that's some of the stuff I wanted to get into as well because the thing about it is uh, everybody talks about going to the these different higher spiritual realms. Uh, Israel Regardi and Samael Anvior both talk about that, you know, the astral realm is actually a place for spiritual ascendance. Uh, it's just an, it's like worlds within worlds. And I, I know that a lot of people want to talk about that, but just to recap real quick, there's two methods of doing this you can relax to that point to the heavy vibrating state and actually use some of the methods to get a roll out of your body or you can use visions and actually put yourself in a lucid state and work your way out of it that way right there's a few ways to do it right do critical thinking throughout the day this will wake you up in the dream state uh, you know, a real good way is just to meditate on a person, a deceased loved one, each night and say, I want to see you. Take me to the other side. And they will. They want to meet you, but you kind of have to meet them halfway. There's a veil between the physical world and uh, the astral world. It's not uh, so much a veil, it's just a change of an octave. A vi it's a much higher vibration. That's so cool. All right, so, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about... Uh, well, I'm going to talk about the physical realm, actually interacting with this realm, or maybe the realm next to it, and then we'll get into some of Preston's travels 
and uh, we'll take your questions too. 1 800 588 0335 is the call in number. You can join us in the speaker chat. Also, there is a Discord chat, and if you want to hashtag anything, it's hashtag LTV Radio. Be right back. Roger roll, Discovery. From Studio 303, it's the Stranger Than Fiction News, right here on the Fringe FM. Bringing light to the stories that surround us. Astronomers using a telescope in Chile have discovered a star whose strange dimming and brightening of light are reminiscent of Tabby's star, which was once suggested to host an alien megastructure. The megastructure idea, first posted in 2015, was later quashed by data suggesting that the dips are probably from dust particles obscuring the star's light. The new star's behavior is probably not due to aliens either, but it's baffling, says astronomer Roberto Sayato of Federal University of Santa Cantaria in Brazil. He and his colleagues reported the star's flickering back on November 6. This was brought to you by ScienceNews.com. And as antique gold coins from the Middle East pour into the United States, some looters are turning to the spirits called the Jinn in their hunt for gold treasure. A few gold seekers even go as far as to get the Jinn to possess them in hopes that the spirits will guide them to the hidden jackpot. However, research by archaeologists and an investigation conducted by Live Science suggests that rarely, if ever, does using the Jinn help looters find gold artifacts. Rather, metal detectors and mass excavation of archaeological sites seems to be the most effective way of looting treasure. And a new report of a dogman spotted in California. A California man shares his encounter with what he believes was a dogman creature. The dogman is a cryptid reputed to live in the northwestern quadrant of Michigan's Lower Peninsula. Although other sightings have been documented in other states, such as Wisconsin, this unproven creature was first reportedly spotted back in 1887 by two lumberjacks who described it as having a human body and a dog's head. And in 2017, a woman in Michigan claimed to have seen a similar creature. In 2015, a group of three people in Michigan reportedly came across an unidentified dog-like creature in the woods of St. Clair County. You can read all about the dog man at cryptozoologynews.com. And time for this edition's fun fact. There is a basketball court on the top floor of the U.S. Supreme Court building. Its nickname, the highest court in the land. And that wraps it up for another edition of the Stranger Than Fiction News, right here on the Fringe FM. I'm Vance Nesbitt, anchor and news sorcerer. Do you want to lose weight but have no idea where to begin? The Fast Start Diet, a three-day weight loss plan, is the answer. Three days of nutritionally balanced, calorie-restricted meals delivered right to your door. No shopping, no measuring, and no cooking. Everything is prepared for you and ready to eat at home or on the go. The Fast Start Diet has all the amazing benefits of intermittent fasting without starving. We've helped thousands of people who have struggled to reach their weight loss goals. Isn't it time we helped you? With the Fast Start Diet, you'll lose weight and feel great. Find us on Amazon or go to FastStartDiet.com and use promo code POWER to get $10 off your first box. As a special bonus, we will include our number one rated Lipo 3 Appetite Suppressant Spray free with your order. Whatever your diet plans are, start with us at FastStartDiet.com and use promo code POWER. You're listening to Lighting the Void. The call-in number is 1-800-588-0335. If you would like to text, 
You can text Dan at 501-777-5631. Okay, we're here with Preston Dennett. We're exploring astral travel, talking about his book, Astral Travel, Out of Body Exploring, excuse me, A Beginner's Guide. And um, some pretty good questions in the Spreaker chat. Don't forget, you can text in the show as well at 501-777-5631 if you want to text in. If you got any questions for Preston, uh, pretty interesting uh, stuff that we've talked about. A little bit about the methods of how to get out of body. I would say that, um, do you recommend a particular teacher? Like if I if I was to recommend somebody in my experience, I would say, well... I would read Robert Monroe's books and do William Buellman's uh, tapes and listen to those. But do you have someone that you would recommend to listen to uh, if they actually wanted to have an experience? Uh, yeah, I love Robert Monroe and William Buellman. They're definitely uh, the leaders, I think. Sylvan Muldoon, he was an earlier astral travel. He wrote writes about this very lucidly. Uh I think you kind of got, want to find what resonates best with you. Uh, so it's sort of a matter of searching out, you know, which methods and which books you really, you know, are drawn to. I, th- I think the important thing is just trying it. You know, it's f- so easy to do and the, there's no special qualifications. You know, you don't need to be like in excellent health. You don't need to be like morally good or anything uh, like, you know, a, a holy man or a nun or a monk or something like this. It's, it's for anybody. You know, right. It's just, I'd say all you really need is the open mind. A yeah. little time, a little time, you know, the desire to do it, the more effort you put forth, I think the more successful you'll be. And really, I think there's no danger. You know, people talk about the dangers of getting locked out of your body, possessed, or, you know, going too far out and getting lost. Or walk-ins. Uh, yeah. um, being attacked by hostile astral entities, you know, things like this, which are really overblown. I, I really scoured literature on this and uh, have done all kinds of stuff and have had none of these problems. You have this kind of silver cord that draws you right back if you just so much as think about your body or if you get the least bit scared, you're back sometimes instantly. Uh, sometimes you go through like these tunnels of light and stuff. It depends. Right. Uh, uh, but it definitely draws you right back. I want to say something real quick and then we'll get on to these journeys because I know this is important to some people. Um, like Joseph saying, when I meditate, I sometimes I fight my sleep and man, I know exactly what you're talking about, but I think a trick that, both Preston and I've probably forgot to mention was that if you're super tired and sleepy or if it's time for you to go to bed, it might not be the best time to try it. In my experience, actually, there's a couple of tricks you can do. Uh, you can do it when you're not tired and get in a, and work yourself into a relaxed state, whether it's midday or just some time that you're not tired. Don't sleep on your bed, like lay on the couch or there's another trick you can do where you can set your alarm clock to wake up at three or something in the morning, walk around for a little bit and lay back down and then do it that way. But I think if you're, you're doing it like during your normal bedtime in your bed or you're tired, it's probably not the best time to attempt it. Would you agree with that, Preston? Well, I wouldn't say there's anything dangerous about it. You're just not likely to be super successful. If right. You're just that's gonna... what I meant. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but you know what? A lot of you people, when they first start having experiences, they don't remember going in or out. They just suddenly will wake up, and they're already on the other side. That's pretty common. A lot of my early experiences were like that. And I think that sort of jumps over the, the fear of having to you know, try and do this consciously. Because that's a little... That's, people think like, well, I just have to wait there and wait there until my body's buzzing and... If it doesn't buzz, then I'm not getting out. Well, no, that's not necessarily true. You can just fall asleep and say, tonight, 
I'm doing it. Let me do it tonight. I want to remember. And in the middle of the night, you'll wake up and you're doing it. Yeah, see, that's never happened to me. I wish it would, though. That would be great. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? it's, it's, well, just it's yeah, it's again, there's a sort of aspect where you really want to focus. You're like, all right, this is priority number one. Don't talk to me. I'm, I'm reading my books on out of body stuff, I'm doing my meditation, and buckle down and do it for an hour, you know, each night. I know it's a lot to ask. Five minutes would be amazing if people, because people, we have a tendency to say, oh, yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. But we don't. Right. And so you, you really want to take that five extra minutes, sleep an extra hour. For me, my success, sex, my success in this was always on weekends when I could sleep in. And it's, I still have a tendency to do that. You know, I think that the now that I remember it right, I think the one time that that one time experience I told you that I really didn't, I know I did it was I was listening to William Buhlman's tapes, but he did, had a trick to where he would, you know, you'd set your alarm clock to wake up at the witching hour, like three or four o'clock in the morning, walk around a little bit and then lay back down. And that's exactly what I did when I did it that one time. Now that I think about it. Yeah, I've done that. Stephen LaBerge talks about that as well. And a good way to sort of really cement that is to try and read something when you wake up and just do a little bit of reading and then you can go back into, and, and, uh, that will work as well. Really well. Some of the creepy things I think that you might have over me is you, you mentioned earlier that people would be standing in your room, right? When you woke up. Uh, yeah, there's been times I've sensed very friendly presences, people or saw them spirit guides, I guess you might call them, and times that they were definitely not friendly. (laughs) Uh, So I've had a little bit of a variety, and I think that happens. Uh, I think someone asked earlier about, you know, meeting uh, spiritual beings on the other side, and absolutely, that's kind of why I really got into this, is following, you know, the death of my mother. I'm like, all right, if there's life after death, she's out there somewhere, and I'm going to meet her. And what I started doing is... I had my third experience, my fourth, and it was, they would last about five seconds, and I'd be like, I'm doing it, yay, and I was so (laughs) excited, pulled right back into bed, and so I'm like, all right, I am too excited, took, you know, a couple of more months, I'm like, stretched it out to 10 seconds, and a couple of more months, I had down to like 30 seconds, where I'm like, okay, just breathe, you know, you're fine, you're fine, and I'd walk through the house, and I had to learn how to see, really, because that was bizarre. I had trouble seeing from out of one eye for a while, or there would be lots of shadows, and I was, I would think something, and it would be there, or the room looked different, and so it was a little strange at first. And moving was really hard. I'd pop out, and I'd be stuck there. I'd be like, "Well, what do you do now?" And I'm trying to swim. I'm flapping my arms, and it's not working. <laughs> and you took, know. I almost wish, Preston, I never would have heard somebody talk about how they couldn't see when they got out of body because I never had that issue uh, until I heard someone say that. And I'll be damned if it didn't happen to me one time where, you know, I was, I, I wasn't, I wasn't in my house, but I rolled out of a bed. We'll just say a bed and I couldn't see anything. And I was like, damn it, you know. And I was thinking of what William Buhlman said, you know, uh, awareness now or clarity now or whatever. And I was trying to get my vision. And, it, you know, by the time I finally got my vision and stuff, I was back in my body. So it was after that one really good experience, it was always some type of struggle. Uh, vi- like you're saying, vision. One time, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but I was sleeping on my stomach and I started rising up and I felt pressure in my ears. Like... Almost like if you were underwater in a swimming pool. So as I was coming out of my body, I felt pressure on my head. Have you ever heard of that? Uh, I have. I've, I've experienced things like that a few times, not a lot, uh, where you feel kind of unpleasant physical sensations that are like, well, this, if it gets any worse, this is going to be you know, not good. Uh, yeah, I felt like pressure on my eyeballs. Uh, I felt pressure on my head a 
couple of times. That's so uh, weird, right? That kind of worries me. Like, why does it feel like my head's being squeezed and I can feel pressure in my ears? And it just seemed that, like a fight after that every single time. That's sometimes like you're slipping in and out and there's it's a, there's a little bit of a strange sensation. There's these exit distractions, they're sometimes called, and you can hear all kinds of stuff. It sounds like, you know, jet engines I mentioned earlier, but you can hear things like furniture moving and banging and cursing. I've heard this. It's bizarre. <laughs> you hear like, hear like, you know, not nice voices saying awful things. Uh, people calling your name. It's this weird sort of thing that happens right at the moment you kind of go out of body. And uh, I think that's part of it. Can you, do you think that we're actually here? You know, I was mentioning earlier that you you were talking about the higher realms and stuff, and we'll talk about that too because that's some really cool stuff. But I am more at the at the moment fascinated with traveling around here, and from my experience, I feel like that I am. Does it feel like that to you? Like you're actually here? Say, you know, if I at this moment, if I laid down and had an out of body experience, I could. I would be physically or somewhat in my son's room if I wanted to go there. Oh, yeah. Um, it's amazing because, you know, we talk about astral travel, natural projection. The truth is we're projecting down here into physical bodies. Our true home is on the other side. That's where we really are, our true selves. Uh, uh, but wait, we're So we're... So what you're saying is, oh, that's cool. I didn't mean to cut you off, but I understood what you were saying for a second. It kind of amazed me. So we're already out of body. We're just kind of hanging out in the body right now, basically, is what you're saying. Uh, Yeah, and for a long time, and that's kind of the problem, is we're having this experience where we purposefully have amnesia, and we're coming here new to, to learn stuff, and it's a crazy physical realm. We're actually projecting down here, in a sense. Oh, and, uh, okay. So, so going out of body, what happens is you pop out of body, and you're like, "Wow, here I am in the physical world, and look at this. Here's my house, and it looks a little different. It's glowy, right? Everything glows a little bit, and but it's the physical world, or kind of a replica of it, the astral sort of counterpart. And uh, what happens is, yeah, you can explore it certainly, and I think beginners definitely want to do this and they start looking around to prove it's not a dream and walking through walls and visiting you know friends and stuff like this that's what i did Uh, but at some point you get drawn to the other side you get pulled there because that's where all the fun is i guess or it's just your sort of natural robert monroe talked about this the astral body's natural tendencies vibrates at the other side that level so you're automatically drawn there yeah well you know what convinced me about robert is when he discussed flying over the houses that was the first time that i thought he might actually be telling the truth because he was talking about how he got lost and he was like you wouldn't think you'd get lost in your own neighborhood but when you're flying 100 feet over the top of your house things don't look the same so you got to have a good sense of direction to know where you're at you know it's funny he's right my sister-in-law, she lives like three miles away, maybe. I'm like, all right, I can do this. No, I, I, I never really did it the way where you just fly kind of over the street. I would always lose consciousness or kind of get distracted or lose my way. Finally, I just kind of targeted there, and I made it several times. Uh, so there, you, you have a tendency to teleport at some point. You're, you're like traveling along. I remember reading about you know going through telephone wires, and I'm like, all right, I've heard of other people doing this. I'm like, that's a little scary. I have to admit, once you're out of there actually doing it, you're like, you know what? I'm, and, I, and I kept avoiding them. I'm like, fine, you know, other people have done this. I'm going to do it. And I flew right through it. And darned if the thing didn't, like, flare up a little bit. I had a little flash of light. And I'm like, whoa. <laughs> and then after that, I did it again and nothing. And I don't feel it. I'm like, well, I'm not physical. Everything's going to be just fine. And I go through it. But the first times you're doing, you know, exploring the world from above, it's crazy. And you're like looking down at trees and flying around your building and 
going above the freeway and you, you do all of that and it's amazing really and the feeling of flying is like nothing else honestly how many times do you think that you attempted this before you actually started becoming successful at leaving the body not necessarily going to the higher realms but staying out of body for more than a minute or two doing what you wanted to do and then coming back uh you know i like i said it didn't take me that long to start but i stuck by it it's kind of like learning a, a new language maybe or a musical instrument or a, a sport or something that which the more devotion you put to it you start to really get some great payback so if you keep with it you know if you have like one and you're like wow that was amazing it scared me too much and you don't keep with it well you're going to miss out on all the fun of visiting your deceased loved ones or learning about your past lives or visiting healing temples or advanced masters who you know are enlightened and all kinds of experiments with you know food and anything you really want you know any fantasy you want to create you can actually do it there's all kinds of stuff you can do and you feel it oh yeah you know i there's you know there's the seven deadly sins right there's, yeah there's there's lust there's greed there's anger there's and all this stuff comes spilling out a little bit when you do astral travel because the astral body is actually called the desire body and this is where you have a lot of your emotions. You can go higher to the mental body. And this, these are kind of ways of breaking down the various bodies we have. It's not just the astral body. We have seven bodies according to the Eastern tradition. And uh, I think that that's probably true because you start to experience it. Okay. And when, you, when, you do, when you first start out and you're like, all right, I can stay out for a few minutes now and I can get to the other side. You start to encounter your own sort of obstacles, psychologically speaking. I had a lot of anger I didn't realize I had, and I was became very destructive. I'd create these scenarios, and I would just destroy things. I also had a lot of uh, you know, food issues, apparently. I would create these feasts of uh, you know, roast chicken, brownies, Neapolitan ice cream, yeah. you know, sour cream and onion and potato chips. And I would just go <laughs> yeah. down on these things. And, oh, it's the most amazing thing because you got to remember you're awake. I mean, you're awake like you are now, almost in a hyper real way. And you're actually doing this stuff. And you can taste it. Oh, yeah, you absolutely. Disappears sort of, I mean, for me, halfway down my throat and I wasn't getting full. And it was a slightly muted taste to some of it. Uh, and temperature in terms of the ice cream wasn't like super cold. Uh, but yeah, I could sure taste it. Absolutely. And, you know, I'm going to ask that question, right? If you can eat food and you can do you can do every, everything, like everything, everything. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. And you never I mean, had any uh, guilt or anything with it like you do here when you do something bad or did you? No, I felt like this is a great stage, you know, to work out your problems. Robert Monroe talked about, you know, the power of sex on the other side. Yeah. And uh, Patricia Garfield, she was another writer about, who talked about how her experiences of going out of body were very orgasmic. And Robert Monroe talked about, you know, coming upon sex scenes and feeling overwhelmed with sexual energy. And this does happen as well. If, if you're a lustful person and and, uh, boy, I definitely had some fun with that. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, but, you know, uh, he also did, uh, if I remember the books correctly, he also did run a, uh, into this place where all these bodies were mangled up and it was just people really lost, give, lost. Yeah, yeah, given into it to a point to where it was disgusting. He talked about how he just wanted to get away from it, you know? Right. And. And his method was to say, you know, I'm just going to put this off and there'll be another time. I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to go through it. I didn't like dive into like a mangling body of flesh like that. No, <laughs> yeah. um, that never happened to me. Uh, but you can definitely create any scenario you want and, and uh, have fun. And that kind of does happen, I think, naturally, unless you've already worked out your issues with it. And that's not, you know, a problem with you. 
Yeah, keep but, in mind, guys, that in the book, too, there's a lot of detailed stories in Preston's book. So everything he's talking about, he's really just glossing over here because he gets really detailed in the book. Uh, and I can relate to some of the things where you felt like someone was laying on top of you a few times. Do you remember that? Yeah. And it's a, a weird thing. Cause you're like, you wake up and you're like, well, and I'm wondering if I'm just interpreting the heaviness that you sometimes feel when you're like pulled instantly out of body, because sometimes that sort of things happens. You sort of like, translate the sensation you're feeling into an image but other times you wonder i mean there was one time i don't even know if i put this in the book where i was you know doing a lot of this kind of stuff and i was having this erotic dream where someone is you know touching me and i'm like and i woke up and darned if i could not still feel their hands all over my body whoa for, for a good three seconds four and i'm like whoa if this were happening to anyone else they'd think you know demons you know or something yeah but, succubus but, right and i'm like well maybe it is but it, then it was gone and it stopped so i'm like well you know it was what it was i felt it and i've had a lot of you know there are sometimes little bleed throughs when you do this kind of stuff you know you'll have i remember you know stuff fall over once or twice in the house. Well, bleed like throughs is something uh, we've discussed here, like paranormal activity that people think is ghost. I I think it. Well, I did some experiments, like tapping on tables and stuff, um, when I was experimenting with it. And so somehow or another, these beings can interact with the real world. Uh, I just haven't figured out how it works yet. But I, I believe it's real because I've attempted it with my son. I don't know if I told you about that, but he was playing yeah, video I, games and I rolled out one night and went in there and just tapped on the table beside him and then immediately went back to my body, woke up, walked in there to him and said, hey, what are you doing? Nothing, you know, just I said, did you uh, hear anything or feel anything? And at first he was like, no, he goes, well, wait. Yeah, there was something that knocked on the table, but I thought it was Leo, you know, or I, f I think that's what he said. He said something. It was kind of mumbled. And I was like, that was me. I tapped on the table. And he's like, what? And I was like, never mind. You know, so you can do it. It's just, I don't know how that could even happen. Yeah, well, from what I understand, it's a, a matter of vibration and the vibration you're at. And one guy, I'm like, you know, I've tried to move physical objects and have never been able to. There are people who can manifest as full apparitions. Robert Monroe was able to do this a couple of times um, to appear as an apparition to other people. I've tried that and have never been successful. Couldn't move anything. But one guy's like, well, you have to lower your vibration and you can draw energy from your physical body. Now, I've never even tried that. So that's definitely kind of on my list. But I do know that sometimes I'll be like flying around and I try to fly through the wall and I bounce right off. I'm like, well, what is going on? Normally I can get right through this. Or, you know, I'm dragged down or something. You know, I, I think there is a level of vibration to it. And you can, you know, like Buhlman talks about, you can raise your vibration. And that's one way of pulling you off to the other side. Lowering your vibration. See, this is new. This is something new to me. I've never heard you talk about is that we have uh, seven different bodies. And you said that earlier. Yeah, this is not to complicate things, but we we normally just talk about you know our physical body and our dream body, our astral body. Right. But but really, we have our physical body, our etheric body, the aura, the astral body, which is the desire body, and this is what most people will experience initially. But you have your mental body. Or uh, the Akashic body, the Buddhic body, the causal body. These are all higher manifestations of your physical body. In some ways, you're not really leaving your body at all. It's very connected to your physical body. You're just going up a vibration. Gotcha. It feels like you're leaving it. But yeah, there's seven of them. And Robert Monroe talked about this. And, and you start to realize it's happening to you when you hit these barriers. And you're like, how do I get past this one? You know, I'd read about like the Akashic plane. That was something I really wanted to try because that's 
like a high, high level. I'm like, well, right. if these guys are doing it, you know, why can't I? Okay. Well, you know, let's hold it right there. I want to talk about this, breaking through these barriers, because this sounds really cool, actually. And you and I have never discussed this before. And then some of the stuff, places you've encountered, things you've encountered, and uh, the higher realms. We'll be right back. You can call in. Remember, if you want to ask Preston a question, 1-800-588-0335. Text in is 501-777-5631. Don't go anywhere. out there there's something out here and so are we ktok digital broadcasting the fringe fm all right everyone this is justin from the uk excuse the chitty chitty if you're into the fringe and you want to hear the brass tacks me old china plate joe Roop, and his guests on light in the void will open your mince pies you need to shut your north and south and use your 10 speed gears and listen to them bubble you could hear a Barry Crocker, no Brussel, but he ain't no holy fryer. Anyway, you be the Barnaby Rudge and take a butcher's. Hey, Friends FM listeners. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or no Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of the Friends FM by calling 701-719-3971. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. Saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Call 701-719-3971. That's 701-719-3971. Listen to the Fringe FM on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? you love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in paranormal talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS app store. Poor water quality is a major health issue, and it's only getting worse. Municipalities can't keep up, standards have dropped, and pollutants are increasing. Where does it all end? It ends by keeping the pollutants outside of your home with HydroCare's advanced systems available at Wave Home Solutions. No less than the best purification materials and processes have been developed by HydroCare to provide you with healthy, clean water for drinking, cooking, and showering. HydroCare far surpasses the competition in removing chlorine, odors, iron, lead, chemicals, lime scale, and much more. Don't settle for less when it comes to your water. We'll take care of the toughest water problems for you, whether it's from a city or well source. Satisfaction guaranteed. For more information, call 888-997-WAVE. That's 888-997-WAVE. Or go to bestwater123.com. That's bestwater123.com. To Lighting the Void Radio. Greetings, galactic community. This is Suzanne Ross, host of Sci Spy Radio, every Wednesday evening from 5 to 7 p.m. Pacific. Join me for this brand new show featuring a revolutionary new genre, Sci Spy, merging science and spirituality to give us answers to the greatest mysteries of creation. Together, scientific discovery and spiritual revelation reveal the truth about who we are, where we came from, why we're here, and where we're going. Tune in to Sci Spy Radio every Wednesday from 5 to 7 p.m. Pacific and discover the truth for yourself at thefringe.com. Want to know what's on the Fringe FM? Check out our schedule at thefringe.fm. Follow the Fringe FM on Facebook and Twitter at the Fringe FM. The Fringe FM loves hearing from you. Have a suggestion, comment, or question? We're all ears. Email talkback at thefringe.fm.
Preston Dennett, we are actually about to take a trip through some of the astral, I guess, realms, barriers. That's where we left off before the break. Uh, Preston was discussing some of the barriers that you run into when you leave the astral body. If you want to hang out with us, you can come into the Spreaker chat room. If you just search Lighting the Void or the Fringe FM on Spreaker, you will find uh, the chat room. We also have a Discord chat, and uh, you can ask your questions in there as well. Now, before the break, Preston, you were talking about, well, I'd ask you a question about, you said we had seven different, uh, I guess, bodies or layers, and that uh, Robert Monroe discussed after a while, you know, he would travel out of the body in this realm, or I guess on Earth, he'd get a little bit bored, and he would try to go through these uh, barriers. Now, I've never encountered any of these barriers, so I'll let you talk about that, because I'm lost when it comes to that. Right. Well, I think what happens for most people is you'll find yourself out of body and you're in the physical world. That's what happened to me. And my whole goal was to see my mom. So I'd call out, I'm like, mom, 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 over and over and over. And it really didn't work for a very long time until one time I popped out of my body and I, and I felt the vibrations and I'm like, whoosh, and I'm out. I'm like, wow. And I floated out to my living room and darned if there wasn't someone there. There was this beautiful black woman who looks at me, and I'm like thinking, gosh, do I know you? I can see you're friendly. Who are you? I feel like I know you, but I didn't. And she just smiles at me, takes me by my shoulder, spins me around, and pushes me in the, on my back through the wall. And suddenly, you know, to make a long story short, I'm, there's my mom. She's floating in front of me. She looks about 20 years old. Um, smiles, you know, it's a complete reunion. Like you just couldn't believe. I mean, she had, she was still alive. She was absolutely there in front of me. I couldn't believe it. And, uh, she grabs me by the hand and basically pulls me up out of this realm and into the other side. And you go through this weird barrier. That's hard to describe other than suddenly snap. You're in a different place and it's a much higher vibration. And how I perceive it is, you know, I'm not a religious guy by any means, but it, I'll call it the heavenly realms because that's what it feels like. It's a very pastoral scene with green fields, trees, lots of flowers, pathways. You know, it's just beautiful. S little streams going everywhere. It's really nice. <laughs> and this kind of level of a sparkly light that's so loving and just beautiful but it's entrancing it's you just never want to leave it's the greatest place ever and she's showing me all this you know she, she took me into one of the streams and actually we splashed in the water and it was really interesting because this water didn't get you wet even it was kind of just really different and uh this so is where i usually you had to have help basically maybe or maybe um, well, for me, that's how I got to, uh, initially. I, I'm not sure if that was my first experience on the so-called, you know, pastoral realms. The, the, this is sort of the astral realms where people go, I think, when they die. This is where I usually see them, at least. Uh, whenever someone dies, you know, that I know of, and, and within, you know, the family or whatever, I usually see them there. Uh, not always. Sometimes, you know, in lower realms. Some, but that's where I saw her for sure. And uh, it was amazing. And I think that's sort of the normal astral body experience that you can definitely look forward to. You can see your pets there. I've seen several of our family pets and uh, all kinds of stuff. But yeah, that's cool. You, but you, you know, the Akashic realm, this is supposedly higher up. I've read about it. You know, I've read about all these places, healing temples. I went to that uh, you can learn about past lives. I did a bunch of that. But one thing I wanted to do was the Akashic 
plane because this is supposedly this library, right? Which talks all about your life and has all the records of everything that ever happened or even could happen. I'm like, all right, you know, that sounds interesting. <laughs> oh, I want to try that. And so I did that, set that as my intention. That's what you really kind of want to do when you do this. You, the more you have a plan, the better, you know, the more success you'll have at mm-hmm. executing it because it's very easy to get distracted. It's kind of a tightrope when you're doing this. And if you really intend to do something, you just want to set your plan and stick to it. And I'm like, I'm doing this. And I you know, don't remember quite how it started. I have to look it up. But I certainly remember coming up on this barrier thinking, oh, my God, I'm, this is a giant black wall. Robert Monroe talked about this. I'm, thinking, I'm like, I, it's behind this black wall, and I've got to get past it. And I couldn't. I just couldn't do it. And I'm banging and banging and banging and banging until I finally squeezed open this tiny little pinprick. And out through this pinprick came this just, I don't know how else to describe it, this glorious divine light this incredible light and I squeezed through it and it was the strangest sensation. You know, when you do this, you can go through brick walls and you can actually feel it and you can feel the sort of vibration of different substances. And this felt like it was completely cleaning out anything that was bad in me. You know, any bad thought that I ever had was just pulled right out of me and I popped out on this other side, which was, Honestly, too high vibration for me to really see clearly. And I could barely remain conscious. It was very, very bright, and the colors were kind of washed out because I just couldn't focus. And I felt a little overwhelmed and humbled, and I just couldn't stay, and I got pulled back. What do you mean but you I, just couldn't stay? It was too overwhelming? Yeah, I didn't feel worthy. <laughs> I'm like, no, no, me, I don't deserve this. This is too great kind of almost, I don't know, it's hard to describe. It was just too much. Now, earlier we were discussing, you know, how that, how short these periods were when you went out of body, from my experiences as well. Uh, At this point, I got to think that you have learned how to either directly do what you want to do as soon as you leave the body, or that you're able to stay out longer, or at least... It's perceived as being longer. Definitely sometimes. Not always, though. And I finally did get to the Akashic Realms, by the way. I tried it again, got past that same barrier, and I was much more in focus. Saw the colors. I saw this beautiful lake. My mom was there. And I'm like, come with me to this library that they're pointing me at. This huge kind of looked like the capital. Um, Was was there grasslands there? Did it look like you know, normal settings or? Yeah, I mean, it was a normal, I mean, normal enough in terms of, you know, it being earth-like, but the everything glowed, had this intense beauty. It was all kind of crystallized, if that makes any sense. Yeah. I mean, this building was gigantic. It had huge pillars, and it looked like it was made out of glowing rose quartz. Wow. That kind of, that kind of reached, had a translucence to it that was, really in- beautiful i mean it's just really pretty that sounds incredible and they pulled me down this hallway and i couldn't really see who was next to me i was really trying to focus i could just barely do it but i stayed there and i could and i was pulled down this co- massive corridor down into another corridor there were openings on either side and he pulled me into this room and i'm like wow it was a, you know just a small room and had i'm looking around it and it's all these screens that look like our windows. I'm trying to make sense of it. They pull me to one of these screens and uh, suddenly I see all these faces flash in front of it slowly at first and then whipping past like a deck of cards of different people, all different races and ages and sex, you know, everything. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Oh, these are my past lives. And I'm like, Whoa, it's going, it's going, it's going. There was a lot. And uh, that, I couldn't really focus on any one of them, but the message was that, you know, these are all your lives. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. And then it stopped, and there's this beautiful man in front of me, and I'm thinking, well, who is this? Because he steps out of the screen. It's kind of like, oh, my God, this person is real, and he's in front of me. 
you know, it's kind of older, bald man with these uh, silver eyes and just a loving expression and sort of like this quality that you sometimes meet in people on the other side who you get a sense that they're you know, spiritually enlightened. And I'm looking at him and I got this feeling like, oh my God, this is a future me. Oh my God. And that was too much. I kind of just fell to my knees and I'm like, oh, a little weepy, I guess. <laughs> um, but wow, I mean, that was one of the best experiences I've ever had really out of body. You say you felt weepy. You you saw, do you think that was your absolute higher self? Um, I was thinking that that was a future version of me. I'm not going to say absolute, but just seeing his expression and feeling that connection and then thinking, oh my God, you know, what if this is what I think it is? And huh. uh, when you yeah, went just, to the, this library, were there lots of people there? Yeah, there were. And I couldn't really see them. Again, I was like in a weird state that's hard to describe. I'm like in and out a little bit. I'm like, I'm not letting go. <laughs> no, don't let me go. And I'm really hanging out and I could see in front of me. And I could and I could sense the person behind me, and I could sense people walking all around, and these rooms were filled, and there was people out in front too on this giant sort of veranda, uh, or you know a front gal, I don't know, you know the front steps. Yeah. Uh-huh. But yeah, it was amazing, and there's also, I mean, the stuff you can do out of body is insane. One t- I read about these healing and healing temples, I'm like, hey, that's something I haven't tried. And I'm like, let's try. I'm feeling a little run down. And I uh, felt the vibrations, and I popped out of body. I'm like, whoa, I'm doing it. It's always really amazing <laughs> Every to this time, day. you're super every, stoked. Huh? Every time. And I'm like, okay, I don't have much time because you know, I'm limited still. You know, 15 minutes is a good out-of-body experience for sure. Yeah. And, uh, uh, 740 area code. You're on the air with Preston Dennett. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Who are we speaking with? All right. My name's Mike. Hi, Joe, Mike. I, I've, been listen, I've been listening to your show for for quite a while, and uh, I respect your thoughts, and you're a pretty truthful guy. And this, this guy we're listening to now, I want you to ask him if there's any way that he can back up or prove that he can do what he's saying he's doing. And that's I'll take my answer off the air. All right. Thanks for your call, Mike. Good question. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, it is, and I appreciate the question. That was kind of what I was obsessed with initially. I'm like, how do I know this is not even a dream? This could very well be a dream. I'm probably making this all up. You know, that's what I'm thinking. Well, you know, I, well, uh, well I got to be honest with you. When the first time I heard Robert Monroe talking about this stuff, I was like, "There's no way in hell this is real. No way." Right. You right. Know? And it's disconcerting. You're like, hmm, because, and so uh, I had a hard time with it initially. Finally, I was able to prove it to myself. I've never been able to prove it to anyone else. Really, I've been able to, you know, do precognition in front of people a few times. I would, you know, always call my sister in law when I had one of these quote dreams that I just knew was going to happen, and uh, she's so she's able to verify that. But in terms of like, I've tried to appear as an apparition in front of people, couldn't do it. Uh, Yeah, I think, well, I think the situation here, as far as what Mike is asking, it's very, it would be very hard to prove this to anybody unless it happens to you. Uh, If my word means anything to any of you, I can tell you that as far as leaving the body in this area, watching myself sleep, flying around knowing that I'm not in a dream and touching things and stuff. I've done that. And when I did it, you you've heard Preston say, Whoa, you know, he's not really expressing just how amazing this is when it happens. Cause you don't believe it until it happens. And that's the one thing that I wanted to do. Like Alex Exum is another host on this network. And I talked to him about it. And it intrigued him. And it's the one thing, Preston, I wish I could do is guide somebody into doing this that never, you know, a super skeptic, I don't care if they're atheist, whatever, and get them to do this. It would change everything, you know. Yeah, you, you don't need to believe in it to try it. If you just try it, I, 
you know, then you'll know that the best way is to actually do it yourself. I finally was able to prove to myself by visiting, you know, I was out of body. I'm like, holy cow, look at this. You know, I've never been here. This looks unusual. There's dirt here and it's this huge mound. I see trash. And I'm looking at this whole scene, which is, you know, not too far from my house, but not in a place that's certainly visible or I've ever been to. And so I find, find out, well, you know, I went there physically and there it was, just like I saw. There were a few t- tiny, tiny variations. Uh, it wasn't perfectly aligned, but it was enough to like, wow, that's definitely where I just was. So I proved it t- to myself. But as far as proving t- to anyone else, other people have been able to do it. I haven't been that good at it. And I always get pulled to the other side where, you know, all the fun is. Well, we talked about this on the show before. I want to get a group of people and start doing this stuff. I know that Forest Moon Paranormal has a team where they go out and they supposedly, you know, help people in the astral realm and stuff. But I'd always just wanted to find a buddy or two to validate some of these things with, you know. And it's so hard uh, to get, I guess, to get to that to where you're good at it or you can do it fluently to actually find that person. So that's what the Monroe Institute's all about. These guys like, uh, and if this could help you too, Mike, if you want to look into Thomas Campbell or any of the people that were actually with Robert Monroe when they started developing the hemisync, uh, they, they went about it in a very scientific way, but at the end of the day, there's no way to prove a lot of this to anybody without them actually trying it and attempting it. I, I don't think there's a way. To, is there a way we could prove it? I can't think of any other way without somebody actually doing it. Well, you can go to where someone is and, and look at them and kind of spy on them <laughs> and then come back and say, ah, I saw you and this is what you were doing. Yeah. Uh, you know, which people have done. I've not done that successfully in a way that, you know, I feel would be convincing uh, certainly I've tried though and have visited people a number of times and I've, and often, you know, you'll see people who are out of body and they don't remember it. And I've had arguments with, you know, most of my siblings trying to get them to remember what, while they're out of body and they don't remember. Yeah. Uh, so I've tried various methods of doing this. Well, uh, you remember when Robert did that, he would talk to people and they would they would say to him, oh, yeah, I'm going to remember this. And they never would. Uh, so he finally had to pinch a lady. So when he came back, he would actually see the pinch mark on her because he knew that she would forget, even if she promised she would remember, you know. Right. I remember that. Really wild, yeah. man. Uh, here's a question from uh, Moonlit. He said, in the Spreaker chat, he said, how will I appear to others, Preston? For instance, if Elvis were still alive and with me in my group and he astro traveled, how would he appear to others? Would he be the uh, old man Elvis like he is here in the, his evening robe with the fuzzy slippers and reading glasses? Or would he be the hip young Elvis in the tight pants, black slick, black hair and hip shirt or fat Elvis busting out of a jumpsuit? <laughs> um, it's funny. There, there's a huge variation of clothes on the astral plane. People appear as they want to appear. Generally it's, young i I got real into this because i'm thinking well you know i'm doing this all the time what do i look like i never even examined how i was dressed you know i basically sleep in my underwear i'm thinking going around there in my underwear and i popped out of body and i made a point to really just look down and see what my clothes look like and darned if i wasn't wearing this button-down shirt that i you know didn't even own anymore and you know a nice dress shirt (laughs) i'm like dressed up as i go you know to the office or something all right. Was not expecting that. Uh, so, yeah, you can manifest in all kinds of ways. For me, you know, I've lost most of my hair at this point. And uh, every time I go out of body, or often at least, my hair comes flowing back in. And you can, like, manifest a mirror and, boy, you look great. <laughs> You're young again. I've examined my hands really closely. Everything's unblemished. You know, I've examined my whole body. It's amazing. You know, this makes me wonder about the whole Matrix thing, the computer program and all that uh, jazz, right? Like the hermetic axiom of all is mind. Like we live in one giant 
mind or God is just one big gigantic program of consciousness and we're just traveling around in it. You know, that would make a lot of sense because the way you describe going through these barriers is almost like someone would be going through barriers in a video game, you know, or, you know, getting that cheat code and ending up in another realm or something. It just, it's just all so wild to me. Yeah. I mean, science kind of got it wrong in terms of they they're saying, Oh, it's a mechanistic universe and there's really no consciousness behind it. When really there's a sort of the universe is consciousness. And, you know, we all have this illusion of individuality and privacy, which is an illusion. We're much more connected to each other than we realize. And, uh, can, you know, on the other side, you don't keep secrets. You know, on the higher levels, everything is very connected and open. And there's a oneness that is pretty much the rule. Uh, it's only down here that there's all this, you know, separation and individuality to the point where, you know, it's causing strife. Tell me a little bit more about these healing temples. Yeah, that's right. I'm, that was one of my intentions. I read about them. You know, there's schools you can go to and all kinds of things. And healing temples was something I wanted to try. Popped out of body. I'm floating above my house. It's looking great outside. I'm like, wow, this is so beautiful. I'm trying to remember what I wanted to do. And I'm like, the healing temple. Take me to a healing temple. You know, I call it out. I intend it. Most people have a spirit guide that will be right next to them and pushing them along. I don't that I can see. I'm kind of sure. Well, I think I do have one there. Sometimes there is, but I never see them. And uh, I always feel like I'm alone out there, honestly. But at any rate, it, it works. You just sort of sent the in- intention to go, and it takes you to um, your destination. And I felt this sort of spiraling force, and I was pulled up maybe 300 feet and hit a barrier or a vibratory state and popped out and I'm on the other side. I'm assuming uh, I'm in another dimension and I'm coming down on this giant stadium, sort of this, God, how do I describe this? A domed building that looked almost like black rock, but grayish maybe. And I'm getting closer and closer. And I'm thinking, well, this is a lot bigger than I thought it was. You know, there's trees around. It's very lush, very beautiful. And this building now looks like the size of a gymnasium. And I go through the roof and I'm in this giant circular chamber. And it's beautiful. The floor has got this pattern, which is, gosh, like a cross hatch on an apple pie. You know, this sort of crisscross pattern uh-huh. of what look like metal slats or bars no, or slats, I guess would be the best way to put it. And my body is put in the center of this thing. Mind you, it's huge. And these slats start sliding perpendicularly back and forth in opposite directions, causing me to spin in a very slow clockwise pattern. And I'm looking up at the ceiling and the walls, and I don't think I've ever seen anything quite as beautiful as these walls (laughs) which were made of a filigree metal, kind of. It's like very hard to describe other than it was sculptured in a way that was much more delicate and beautiful than it could really ever be done, I think, on this planet. And had this light coming through it that was this incredibly divine healing light that brought tears to my eyes. And I just could barely handle the energy of it. And I took it as long as I could, maybe 30 seconds before I just lost consciousness. But came, boy, I woke up, I was feeling, gr- I had so much energy, feeling great. Well, do you ever feel, <clears throat> do you ever feel that it's, that people might think that, you know, in your immediate family, when you talk to people about this, that they might think you're crazy? Because that's oh, what yeah. I worry about. Sure, but, you know, I, I'm i not too worried about that because I know for myself that it's real. I mean, I've proved it to myself. I've certainly read enough about this. I've got 20 or so cases of people who've healed themselves, by the way. It's a great place to get healings. Uh, wow. And uh, I'm not worried about it because I've taught people how to do it, and it's transformed their lives. And sooner or later, we're all going to have our out-of-body experience. 
Um, whether or not you believe in life after death isn't going to change the fact that there is life after death. And there's a lot of evidence in the public arena that pretty much proves it. It's just not just astral travel. We've got all the near-death experiences. We have you know, thousands of accounts of ghosts that mm-hmm. are multi-witnessed. We've got the mediumship reports. You know, people are mediums. There's all kinds of very, very strong evidence that we don't end at death. And doing this gives you a huge head start and you can visit your deceased loved ones. My best friend died of alcoholism. Gosh darn it, he did not go to a good place. He was, when I I met him out of body, yeah, it was like, freaked me out a little bit. Let's uh, Um, hold hold it right there because that was actually going to be one of my next questions was about, you know, bad places. Heaven, hell, demons, all that kind of stuff. Is that real? Or do you just go to a place, um, you just go to a bad place because you were in a bad place when you passed away? Uh, the show's flying by, guys. We, we got a little bit left in the show. Uh, we're in the last part of the show here. So if you got your questions, get them in. 1-800-588-0335 is the call in number. Or you can join us in the uh, Spreaker chat or text in at 501-777-5631. I'm Joe Root. This is Lighting the Void to Ground. From Studio 303, it's the Stranger Than Fiction News right here on the Fringe FM, bringing light to the stories that surround us. Brace yourself because a star in our galaxy is set to explode in one of the most energetic events in the universe. An international team of astronomers led by Joe Callaham from the Netherlands Institute for Radio Astronomy recently discovered a pair of hot luminous stars about 8,000 light years from Earth, and one is teetering on the edge of a supernova. The team predicts that this will produce a gamma ray burst, making the star the first known candidate for such an event found in the Milky Way. This story was published at CosmosMagazine.com. And colliding galaxy clusters look like the Starship Enterprise. Is that the USS Enterprise blurring as it makes its jump to warp speed? Well, no. But a new photo of the galaxy cluster, a Bell 1033, certainly does call the famous Star Trek starship to mind. The image, which was released Thursday, November 15th, is a composite that combines observations in optical light as well as X-ray and radio wavelengths. The later two, which is represented by colors blue and purple, respectively look like the USS Enterprise Evolution the many faces of Star Trek's favorite starship. You can see the photo and the rest of the article at space.com. And a man from Wisconsin claims he saw an unidentified creature he believed looked like a pterodactyl. An anonymous man said that he and his father were driving home last August at about 2 p.m. when they came upon the creature. The eyewitness says the animal was approximately six feet tall and it had skin instead of feathers on its wings. Like a bat, he said, it looked like a pterodactyl or some kind of angel. He added that he was not able to gather video evidence, but that there could be other eyewitnesses. This story was posted at CryptozoologyNews.com. And time for this edition's fun fact. Running amok is actually a medically recognized mental condition. And that wraps it up for another edition of the Stranger Than Fiction News, right here on the Fringe FM. I'm Vance Nesbitt, anchor and news sorcerer. This is all. I listen to Lighting the Void because it's interactive radio with good content, interesting guests, and a humble host. Sharing this journey through the esoteric. Hey, Joe Roop. Thanks for having us along for the ride. Thank you so much. What a delight, believe me. Well, I got a lot of ground to cover. Follow The Fringe FM on Facebook and Twitter at The Fringe FM. 
Hi, this is Aaron Hunter, host of Real Paranormal Activity, the podcast where we tell real paranormal experiences of people from around the world. And we also conduct interviews with authors, investigators, psychics, and mediums. Real people, real stories, real fear. Thursdays at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern on The Fringe FM. See you then. Hey, Fringe FM listeners. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or no Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of The Fringe FM by calling 701-719-3971. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. Saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Call 701-719-3971. That's 701-719-3971. Listen to The Fringe FM on any phone, anytime, anywhere. To call Joe, pick up the phone, dial 1-800-588-0335, toll free from the United States or Canada. You're listening to Lighting the Void Radio. So one of the things that I worry about, uh, Preston from Robert Monroe's books in the astral realm is that he talked about how people would take their addictions uh, and whatever state of mind they were in when they went, when they passed or when they passed away, that they would sometimes be stuck. For instance, if you were addicted to drinking, you'd, you couldn't stop craving alcohol or cigarettes or I, I think I, re- I recall a part in the story where Robert actually ran into a sex addict who thought he was still alive, still trying to have sex with this woman. Just stuff that just sounded God awful uh, to me. And before the break, you had mentioned your friend who was not in a very good state. Can you tell me about that? Yeah. I mean, what happened, this is a real problem, by the way, on the other side, people do get stuck. There are lower realms, almost hellish realms which I've dipped into a little bit here and there. And you feel like a ghost when you're out there and you can get these God awful cravings and you can get attached to things. Uh, but at some point you're, you're drawn to the light on the other side. In most cases, I don't think it's going to be a problem for most people, but when you're suffering from like a heavy addiction, as my friend Roger was, he died of alcoholism and it was, you know, not good. It was not a good thing. <laughs> And about two weeks after he died, maybe three, I popped out of body and I didn't find him in, you know, the heavenly realms. It was a very dark place. And he was screaming He's and basically saying, I'm not ready. I'm not ready for this. I'm not ready. And I just told him, you know, you're going to be okay. You're going to be fine. You know, relax. You're going to be fine. And, uh, was a little freaked out. I have to say, and, uh, prayed for him really hard and, you know, kept, you know, held, held little prayer vigils thing, telling them how much I loved him because it's my understanding that they can feel this. You know, this has been documented in near death experiences and things like this. They can feel your thoughts. They can hear you. And, uh, it does help. And at any rate, maybe I forget exact time. I'd have to look it up a couple of months later. I remembered to, I wanted to go see him again. And I did. I popped up in this, uh, it was a much higher realm, but it was still kind of not nice. You know, it was, you know, L.A. on a bad day. It was dark. It was kind of rough neighborhood. I had the feeling. And there he was. He was behind this barrier. And this is something you run into. These walls, these barriers, there are rivers you can't get across, uh, tunnels, things like this. And I'm like trying to get to him, and I can't. And he's talking in my mind. He's saying, Preston, you know, thanks for all the love bombs you sent. I'm like, hey, you're welcome. And uh, how are you doing? He's like, I'm doing better. I'm well, actually speaking. Normally, it's very kind of telepathic and understood already. And wow. uh, as I'm trying to talk to him and get closer, this nasty man, <laughs> this bad guy, comes barreling at me creates a car and tries to run me over. 
I fly up and he's chasing after me and basically chased me out of there. After five minutes, I'm like, that's it. You know, I can't do this anymore. And I had to go back home uh, and saw Roger just a third time about a month ago. And, uh, you know, I'm calling for my mom. This is what I usually do. I'm like, I want to see her because that's something I like to do. <laughs> and uh, she didn't come. I'm like, well, dad, dad, my brother, Jamie, he wouldn't come. And I'm like, Roger, 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 Roger. And uh, saw him. And, you know, suddenly I was in a different place. The colors became really intense. It was the heavenly realms. And there he was. And he looked a little out of it. He looked a little ill and not quite fully himself. But he was surrounded, you know, by you know a lot of light, and in a much better healing place. So I'm feeling good about it. But uh, so you would yell out that. like that? And that's how you got, or I mean, did you actually yell, or was it just in your mind you were doing that? Some, um, I was yelling. <laughs> that's how I usually do it. Uh, depending, you know, sometimes it's hard to speak. Sometimes you can speak really well. Um, sometimes I'm like, I'm doing it, and I'll start singing. A couple of times I'm like, singing along, and someone starts singing next to me. I'm like, whoa, a spirit guide. And they sing the whole song with me, and I'm like, wow, that is intense. Uh, but, yeah, I call it, call it out, sometimes physically, sometimes mentally. I would say half and half. One time, this happened not too long ago. You know, usually I'll have, you know, wake up in the morning or in the middle of the night, and I'm feeling like, I could do, I can go out of body right now. I'm really relaxed or I'll, I'll feel the vibrations and I'll just pop out. Not too long ago. I'm like, this is like last year. I'm, I went to lay down and I, my eyes were still open and the vibrations came instantly. My eyes are still open. I'm like, whoa. And then they came really strong. I'm like, well, let's go with it. I'd never really done it with my eyes open before and did wait it. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. So your <laughs> eyes were open the whole time. <laughs> yeah i was like whoa that's freaky it was a little freaky because i've ne you know i've never done that it was honestly a little scary because i'm usually you're kind of relaxed you're a little dissociated you're like i'm just gonna do it <laughs> but no i was like da 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 da, -da lay down whoosh, and i'm like all right let's go <laughs> popped out and you I didn't did all kinds of did you see anything i mean like with your did you have any visuals or tracers or did it just happen yeah, I'm looking at the room. I'm like, okay, I see the room, and then the room got a, a blurred slightly, and then crisped up into this into the glowy kind of almost surreal sort of look that you get when you're out of body. Yeah, um, it, it was yeah, really cool. I've done all kinds of experiments. I've heard you know you can get too close to your body and you're sucked back in. I'm like, well, let's see how close I can get. <laughs> so I'd walk around my bed, you know, and I'm like feeling that magnetic pull of your silver cord that's going to pull you back in and uh, learned how to really control that. Yeah, so I've gotten a text message from Alex Exum and said, are you taking calls because this guy's full of it? You know, this is funny uh, that Alex uh, Exum is saying that because when he was on this show, I had told him that I had an out-of-body experience and he was all believe in me you know when he was on here but here's the thing about this folks i know this sounds wild right and you guys know that i don't believe in just anything uh that people tell me and i just don't but this i've had my own experience with and unless you're willing to try it unless you've read you know journeys out of the body with robert monroe audiobook whatever and you've attempted the exercises that he tells you to do. You can shout all day long that you don't believe in it. It's not really going to matter. But I promise you this. If you do attempt it, you do read the book, and you do attempt the exercises, and those things start happening to you exactly as he said, you will be contacting me. And you'll be doing exactly what Preston's talking about. Oh, my God, it's real. You'll, yeah, you'll, you know, you'll start, I, I, I don't. You'll question yourself. You'll be like, ah, you know, but eventually you'll start realizing that there's something to all this. I or you can just stay in your own little place and just keep shouting BS and never really test it out for yourself. Yeah, 
I mean, I totally agree. I don't expect people to believe all of this stuff I'm saying. Yeah, it's wild. I'm absolutely sincere about it. And, uh, you know, if you read the other people's books, I mean, you'll see a lot of the same sort of stuff they're describing. Uh, but, yeah, do it for yourself. That would be my total recommendation. It's so much fun. It's not hard to do. Anyone can do it. And, uh, boy, then you'll believe because it's that first time that you actually do it you're like wow there is life after death just then and there you know it and that alone is so worth it it's so worth it but well visiting your deceased loved ones oh my god flying around it's incredible all the stuff you can do and jeez there's just no reason not to try it at least yeah that's right joe just said put up or shut up translated by moonlit yeah you know uh, being a skeptic is a, a healthy thing, but it's, you know, I, I don't get mad at it because I totally understand when I, I can, I think it wasn't until like chapter seven where I started actually considering that what Robert Monroe was saying might be real. You know, the way he was describing things, I was like, either this guy is a really good storyteller or this, this really happened to the guy, you know, and keep, and keep in mind Robert Monroe was not a spiritual guy. He was already rich. He didn't have to sell anything, nothing. These things just started happening to him, and he built an entire institute that's still there to this day around the subject matter. And we've had some people on this show, Thomas Campbell, a, you know, a NASA physicist who many people, can you can challenge him intellectually, spiritually all day long, and he can put you he can tell you to put up or shut up too but until you go down this road it's i just there's no convincing you you have to try it for yourself and see that's different you know we've had people come on the show that say that they're psychics or magicians or that they've been abducted by aliens and you can't really prove that either but you also can't say well until you've tried it you know you won't believe in it cuz you can't really try some of this stuff but this you can you can do it properly, that you can do it the way that they tell you to do it, and you can try it. And I know some of you are on the edge, because that's how I was. You want to believe that it's real, but you're afraid. And I would challenge you to go ahead and try it, because that's how I was. I was a little scared when this stuff started happening to me, to be honest with you, Preston. Yeah, in the beginning it is scary, but then it gets really fun. <laughs> And some people have been able to, I mean, Robert Monroe, they was able to conduct all kinds of scientific experiments uh, in a laboratory setting and appear as an apparition to people. Sylvan Muldoon was able to appear as an apparition to people. Some people can do this and absolutely prove it. Uh, it's not always, I mean, sometimes things are easier said than done. Uh, for, I still have trouble, you know, maintaining consciousness at times or seeing or even doing it. Um, it, it's very easy to get caught up in the day and the stresses of everyday life. Yeah, exactly. I hope this is who I think is. Is this Sammy? Yes. How are you? Did you sneak away from work again? Or are you sneaking away? Yes, I'm. I'm on a break. Well, yes. What's on your mind? Um. Well, I wanted to call. Um. I think skepticism, of course, is healthy. But at the same time, I can speak from my own experience that I did this every night as a child, not knowing what I was doing, astral traveling, and discovered that one of my classmates, now you figure I'm probably about 10 at this time, I happened to be astral traveling on the streets in a neighborhood that I used to live in and happened to notice him out in the street in the middle of the night. And it was during the school week. And so we weren't as we weren't really uh, friendly as far as being buddies or anything at that point in time. And I went to school, and it didn't dawn upon me about if I brought this up or I asked him what would, how would I explain it. So I just, it didn't, I don't know, I just said to him, hey, what were you doing? out on and I gave the name of the street and exactly what house he was in front of and he had one of his little buddies with him and I said what were you doing out there in the middle of the night 
And he said, I didn't see you. How did you see me? You're like, when did you see me? And I, that's when I told him what street and what house. He said, well, I didn't see you. And uh, I said, well, what were you doing out there? And I found out he'd been thrown out of his own house. His mom threw him out on the street. Here we are, 10 years old. And that right there is my proof for me that I really was astral traveling. When I got older, I realized what it was, and that's when it started making sense to me what was going on with me. Yeah, uh, so you, that validated it for you. And, you know, I think uh, if if you go around and ask a lot of people just out of the blue, your friends and family and whoever, and just say, hey, have you ever had a dream or thought you were dreaming about something that might have actually happened? Because I used to ask people at work about this, and I had a friend named Gavin who said, you know what, uh, I actually did do that one time. He His friends were getting beer out of the back of a Lincoln, and they were staying at a hotel room, and he was asleep in the hotel room. And uh, they came up to the hotel room and said, hey, we got you something. He goes, yeah, I know. It's a 12-pack of Corona. And they were like, how'd you know that? And he told me that he was too afraid to tell them that he was floating around out there, and he saw them because he thought it was just a coincidence. <laughs> Yep. Isn't that weird? Yep. Well, it never dawned on me when he asked me, well, you know, when did you see me? I didn't see you. It just didn't dawn on me in my mind at that time that I would have to explain myself. And I was like, I saw you. And that's all I said. And I left it at that. But as I got older, because I'm trying to figure this all out, what was going on with me, I don't know why I did it. I think I had guides out there that protect, like gave me a hall pass, basically, with the protection or something, because till I got older, I was safe. I could do what I wanted, and I flew around all the time. I mean, just all the time. It was the most wonderful feeling I ever felt in my life. Yeah, that's But so if cool. somebody has, has that skepticism and they, they want to know for themselves, you have to try. You just got to try. And and Good like Preston you. said, it believe me, I uh, totally understand why anybody would think that this is crazy. You know, uh, it's not hard to. It's just like somebody saying the tooth fairy is real. That's what this thing kind of sounds like in a way, uh, until you know you attempt it. But yeah, Sammy, thanks for calling. I appreciate that. Have a good night. You too. Don't work too hard. <laughs> bye bye, Sammy. So. Yeah, I, I did, totally forgot about that, uh, Preston, that I had friends at work. Because I used to, when I worked for Verizon at the call center, I used to talk about this stuff nonstop. Because it, that's when it was happening to me. You know, this was one of the biggest reasons why I started this whole show to begin with was because these things were happening to me. And some of my friends up there would talk about certain things that happened to them that they're like, yeah, you know what? I remember this time. And they never really thought about it until I started bringing that up to them. Right. I mean, that's the probably, I mean, this stuff is absolutely as safe as sleeping. There's no danger of, you know, getting possessed or anything like that. The silver cord will always pull you back. The only real warning I would give is it does gives you a huge psychic boost and you do start to have a lot of, you know, precognition or, seeing stuff that you're like normally you wouldn't have access to uh sort of the normal thing on the other side telepathy telekinesis flying around you know levitation that's all normal human state on the other side sometimes those same so-called superhuman abilities do translate to the other side for some people you know what and speaking of that i'll do you i'll do you one better for anybody that's uh, skeptical about this, you can email me at contact at lighting the void dot com, and I will send you my copy of the audio of Robert Monroe's first exercises. Well, you, they're free, but I could probably just send them to you easier and actually use them. And I guarantee you, at some point, you're at least at the very least, you'll you're going to get to that super relaxed state where you're paralyzed, and you'll get to that what Preston's talking about that vibratory state. And then, uh, from there, it's all up to you. Uh, but I'll send that to you if you're willing to try, but I'm betting there's some people out there that's not willing to try it. They just want to point their finger at it and say, it's not real. And I understand that too, because 
I do that about certain things as well. So I get it. Yeah, well, don't be scared if the, you know if that's what's keeping you away from it. I don't think there's anything to worry about in terms of dangers. I really looked hard at this, and what I found was the opposite. People get all kinds of psychic boosts from it, and you can actually be physically healed. A bunch of cases of that. Uh, visiting deceased loved ones is always amazing. Flying around, it just feels great. It's so much fun. Yeah, that's the only thing that I never got to do, though, was I fly around, I did that, but I never could just, like I told you before, I never got out of my yard. But uh, anyways, I think um, I think it's a good thing. Like, you only wrote one book about this. Wasn't this one of your first books you wrote? Uh, it's an early book. I'm working on a, a second book about all of this stuff, um, you know, because there's a lot of stuff I worked in, you know, has happened since the first book, certainly. And uh, so, yeah, working on a second book, I would say I'm about halfway through it. There's a few things I still want to do, which I haven't been able to do um, always, you know, but uh, there's always something I want to do. But, uh, yeah, absolutely. I think this is such an important subject. And it really changes your life in such a great way. And you say, here's my question, though. You say it's not dangerous. And I believe you, right? Because a lot of people say it's not dangerous. But, you know, when people, what they worry about, um, if I leave my body, how, what if I don't go back to the body? What if I can't get back in? And, uh, you know, I've heard you say, well, I've never heard any cases of that. But how would you know, honestly? So many people die in their sleep or mysteriously die. <laughs> I think I'm, I'm not trying to scare people, but the, you know what I mean? This guy just died in his sleep or mysteriously well, died thing. from some condition. Well, how do we know he wasn't playing out of his body for too long or something? I mean, just go ahead and try. See if you can do it. <laughs> I mean, uh, good luck if you can stay out I and mean, all the power to you. But that's really not how it works. You're pulled back in very easily. And uh, you can be like way the heck out there, farther than you would ever think, and snap, you are back. Um, you know, there's been a couple of times where I'm lying there in bed, and I'm like, gosh, you know, I'm actually awake. I could probably walk around when actually I'm out of body. I'm way, way, way out there. It's called bilocation, and some people are able to, you know, have out of body experiences while walking around. I've never been able to do that. But I'll tell you, there was a couple of times I'm lying there in bed awake. And one time, I actually did this. I opened one of my eyes. I'm like, all right, let's try this. And I could see my room. Couldn't believe it. And I'm like way out there. And it was too disorienting to kind of like try and reconcile this at once. And I got pulled back. But I almost did it. And it was crazy. I mean, you get, you're not going to get locked out of your body uh, you'll get pulled right back in. The problem is staying out. Mm, yeah, that's that's been one of the biggest problems for me. I haven't been honest with you. I haven't had an experience in a long time. Like I said, I just pass out. You know, I'm, I'm freaking so tired. I fell asleep in the chair uh, five hours ago before this show started. You know, I had to wake myself up and walk around. So it's been a long time since I've had an experience. But I don't practice. I don't dedicate myself to it like I used to. And I should, because I know uh, there's a lot of people curious about this. And uh, one of these days, I'm going to come to one of you guys' houses and tap on your window and freak you out. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever done that? Has anybody said, hey, Preston, come to my house. You know, if this is really real, tell me what's in my yard or tested you or whatever. To a certain extent, yeah. And I've tried it and I haven't been super successful. It's hard navigating the physical world. And, you know, I don't... I'm not really drawn to it. And so if you're not like really, really want to do it, it's hard to really muster up the energy to make it happen. And, yeah. but I've tried it and it hasn't worked. And you know, I've tried to meet my sister and she's like, Oh, I had a dream of you that night. I'm like that's about as close as I've gotten. <laughs> so I'm like, have had a little bit of success, a l but so minor that I'm like, hmm. you know, I'm just really not even trying into trying to prove it to someone. Yeah, I can uh -oh. tell. I can tell that you uh -oh. totally don't care about proving it to people. I get that. Uh, I think if I was good enough, if I could, if I could, I would in a heartbeat. Yeah, I probably learn how to do it. You know, just for fun, because that would be cool. 
and I've never done it. So that well, would be definitely something I'd want to try. I do remember the first time I heard you on the radio. It was the reason why you've been on this show like four times now. But the one reason why I wanted you on this show was because I heard your episode with Art Bell. It was like a three hour long episode where you described your out of body experiences. And Art Bell himself said that he had one too and that he had been trying to get back there. And uh, Preston's here trying to help some of us get back there. We only got, uh, we're at the very, very last part of the show. We only got a few minutes left after this break, so you guys get your questions in. We'll be right back with Preston Dent. The French FM. You're listening to Lighting the Void Radio. Hello, this is Vance Nesbitt. Take the time to expand your mind by listening to Lighting the Void with Joe Roop right here on the Fringe FM. Poor water quality is a major health issue, and it's only getting worse. Municipalities can't keep up. Standards have dropped, and pollutants are increasing. Where does it all end? It ends by keeping the pollutants outside of your home with HydroCare's advanced systems available at Wave Home Solutions. No less than the best purification materials and processes have been developed by HydroCare to provide you with healthy, clean water for drinking, cooking, and showering. HydroCare far surpasses the competition in removing chlorine, odors, iron, lead, chemicals, lime scale, and much more. Don't settle for less when it comes to your water. We'll take care of the toughest water problems for you, whether it's from a city or well source. Satisfaction guaranteed. For more information, call 888-997-WAVE. That's 888-997-WAVE. Or go to bestwater123.com. That's bestwater123.com. Wave Home Solutions for a healthy, comfortable home. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Follow The Fringe FM on Facebook and Twitter at The Fringe FM. Lighting the Void is proud to announce Mind and Magic's Protection and Defense Course for protection from magical and psychic attacks. This is not a joke. Magic practitioners are on the rise, and with that comes attacks from baneful or black magicians that try to harm or hurt others for their own selfish reasons. If you are not a believer in psychic attacks, then this isn't for you. If you are and you want the power to defend yourself and your family and home, then I highly suggest you grab Freighter Xavier's Protection and Defense course. In this course, you will learn how to tell if you are under attack from a natural source or if an individual is attacking you. The four forms of curses and attacks. How to remove self-imposed curses. The correct way to cleanse your home from negativity or malevolent entities. How to make your own holy water. What you should always keep near or under your bed. Herbs that banish negativity and promote purity. The most powerful banishing rituals on the planet. And for those that seem to want to harm you the most, how to put your enemies in a hell pit of their own making. You can also learn protection against shadow people and other entities. Or are you just in a bad planetary alignment? Even how to get rid of an enemy using a tic-tac box. It does not matter what your faith or belief is. This will work. Click the banner on the website at lightingthevoid.com or go to lightingthevoid.com forward slash Xavier. Want to know what's on the Fringe FM? Check out our schedule at thefringe.fm.
talking about the out-of-body experience, one of our favorite subjects on Lighting the Void, with one of our favorite people, Preston Dennett. The website is prestondennett.weebly.com, right? Is it prestondennett.weebly.com or .net? I keep forgetting, Preston. Dot .com, that's dot right. Com. And uh, here in the last part of the show, I want to talk to you about one of the things that scared me and maybe try to get some, um, I don't know, some clarity on the subject. A few times with the experience that I had, I saw these, uh, you, you remember me telling you about these shadowy, raw shack looking blob things, right? Uh, to the, do you remember me telling you about that, Preston, before I go on? Um, no, I don't think so. Well, one time I did, I tried to come out of my body and uh, I had these, I guess you could say, black shadowy blob type they look like Rorschach symbols that you know what i'm talking about on those cars they were just blob shadowy figures and they kind of shoved me back in and i i think that was one of the last times or last experiences i had that really freaked me out and i've heard you talk about you know some things grabbing your leg i've heard you talk about some of these uh being saying mean and awful nasty things i even remember reading in robert monroe's book where he discussed how he had gotten to a tussle with a being in the astral realm so much that it scared him to the point of begging and praying um and he wasn't a religious person but that's how scared he was you know he was praying to god and jesus for help and the beings in that realm actually said you know laughed at him and said, listen to him, pray into his God, right? So, you know, I'm not trying to freak people out, but there are some, um, I guess you could say, malevolent type beings in these realms, right? Well, yeah, certainly. I mean, that can happen. I think for most people, that probably won't. Most people are instantly pulled to the other side when they die, certainly. And uh, when you have an out-of-body experience, it's sort of like attracts like to a, to a certain extent, uh, uh, you know, you want to get to the other side, you sort of fly straight up as fast as you can, you visualize it and poof, you're through. Sometimes you'll go through these shadowy realms and uh, it takes a little while to get there or you hit a barrier. Um, there's been one time it was a little disconcerting. Um, this happened, I don't think this is in the book, certainly, well, but... I popped out of body and I'm exploring through the house, just walking through the house, you know, not really having any plan. I really had no agenda. And I walked through the front door and I looked out on the street there and there was these three guys. And I knew instantly these were real people and they were dead and they were not nice people. And uh, they saw me, we caught each other's gaze and they made a beeline right for my door. Whoa. And it freaked me out. No, you know, I heard you. Oh, just send them love. Send them a beam of love, and you know they won't come closer to you. I'm like, well, you know what? I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm just leaving, and I went right back into my body as fast as I could because I just didn't want to s- confront them. Um, it was too scary. I'm gonna say probably that's you know this one of the. I don't, you know, I I don't want to say I was terrified really. I'm like, I'm just leaving. <laughs> I wasn't really even super scared because I knew I could just leave. But it was one of the most disconcerting times. Uh, Another time I'm flying along. I'm like, gosh, that looks like I'm trying to get to the other side, right? I'm like, just flying through these gray clouds. I'm like, gosh, here we, this is is one of those borders. It's taking a while, it's taking a while. And I see something up ahead, like eyes. And I'm like, hey, that looks like a person. And I'm like, well, that's not a person. And I zoom right by it. It's a gray. It's a gray alien. (laughs) Oh, I'm like, wow. holy smokes. I'm like, whoa. Because it was looking at me, you know, kind of tr- tracked me as I went by it. And I'm like, so that, yeah, that freaked me out a little bit. I didn't feel anything malevolent from it. I just wasn't expecting it. And I got right up close to it. So I'm like, wow, what the heck was that? Um, but, you know, little things like that, you know. Uh, I've kind of dipped down into the hellish realms a little bit, but it's too dark and screamy and and just unpleasant that I can't really do it so I just pretty much it does I don't go there 
or it doesn't happen. I never really believed in like hell or the hellish realms or whatever until I read uh, Lon Milo Duquette's book where he talked about um, the astral. He had a book called The Astral Light um, where he would, you know, go out of the body and stuff. And uh, of course, everybody knows Lon Milo Duquette and he's highly respected, but he did talk about lower realms and lower places and he was taking somebody along with him. He had gotten that good to where he could take people with him, and he told this person that, uh, if I remember correctly, I'm probably butchering this all together, but didn't, you didn't want to go down there, hang out in that place too long. But the fact that it even exists bothers me, that there is a place that people can get trapped in. And I, it doesn't seem like, from what I've studied about it, that God sends them there. It almost seems like that they send themselves there, if that makes any sense. Yeah, and this turns up in near-death experiences. People sometimes see this sort of thing. And if you do out-of-body travel, at some point, you're probably going to be recruited to sort of rescue souls. I I read about it and finally like, hey, I want to try this and had an experience with that. Because uh, it's a problem. Apparently, yeah, people do get stuck in the lower realms and they're just not willing to feel worthy of going any higher or they're they're attached. They don't want to leave. They're wait. They love their house, you know, or they're hooked on drugs, or they want sex, or they're they love food. Even they love a person. There's all kinds of reasons. A lot of people have no idea they're even dead. They're skeptics. They just don't believe it. And when they survive death, it doesn't even them that this is what's happened. Uh, so there's all kinds of things that can leave people stuck. I don't know how huge of a problem it is, but apparently it is a problem, and it pops up in most of the major books on the subject. Right. I, uh, I didn't. Uh, I didn't believe that either. Uh, and when I first heard about it, until I got caught in a false awakening that kept happening. I've talked about it on this show. I kept waking up and trying to turn my phone on, and it wouldn't it wouldn't come on, and I kept trying to wake up and wake up again. And I kept going through the same scene over and over again. And about the fourth or fifth time I was like, would you, you know, just wake up. And I would, you could even feel my eyes just moving real hard, like twitching back and forth, trying to wake up. And I thought maybe I'm dead. You know, maybe I'm stuck here in this spot trying to turn my phone on. It was very, very scary. I I ended up waking up though, but I did. I remember sitting up on the couch, Preston, and thinking, "Man, if I if I got trapped in just that stupid little event, what other things could I get trapped in? Like, say, if I passed away, you know." Right, and you can see some of these hauntings are of historical figures, and you're like wondering, "Well, you know, how long have they been trapped here? And is that truly them? And what's going on here?" So, uh, yeah, I know it's a problem. I don't know t- the extent of it, but it's certainly lots of social work available on the other side, so to speak. Do you think that maybe that, uh, like we were talking before, where there are some people that are so caught up in the, in the earth that they just, you know, that don't believe in the paranormal at all. And if, you know, they pass away, they'll have a harder time accepting these things than you um do you think that there is a a readiness some people are ready uh and they can when they die they'll be able to handle it better because they've had these spiritual experiences or out-of-body experiences do you think that factors in at all just your opinion oh yeah absolutely people who have near-death experiences uh they feel like they have no fear of death, and a lot of them have continuous out-of-body experiences. I think if you do astral travel, you start to realize like you've got a leg up. You're going to be able to do all kinds of things when your final time comes, uh, and you're not going to have a problem with it. I don't think most people are going to have a problem if they've even heard of you know, the other side or ghosts or anything like this. Uh, People who are extremely closed-minded or regimented in their thinking are probably the ones who have uh, problems with this. Or the super-religious, you remember in Robert's book, where 
you know, he would go up to these people and try to help them. And they thought he was the devil and that they'd went to hell, you know, right. <laughs> that was crazy. I laughed at first and then I felt sorry for him. I was like, man, what if they really feel like, what if they really think they're in hell? You know, that's a trip. It is. The world's a crazy place. And this is why this <laughs> subject is, I think, really important because it does raise your awareness. And uh, you do, you know, have a lot of really wonderful experiences because of it. But your actual raising of your awareness, geez, I mean, it's hard to describe how much it changes you mentally in a good way. I think the thing that throws me off and throws a lot of people off on the subject matter, Preston, is that when we go to sleep at night or when we go unconscious or when we have surgery and they put us down, there's nothing but, to, you know, to us, there's nothing but blackness. There's nothing, you know, especially when you have surgery, right? You know, most of us have had surgery. You get put down. Next thing you know, you wake up and hours have gone by. It, it feels like, you, you know, you just went to, went to sleep, excuse me, and you don't, it really doesn't make sense. So those moments are the ones that make me doubt. Even though I've already had an experience like you, and I know I had it, just the fact that I've had some um, experiences where I've went totally unconscious and there was nothing makes me still wonder. I still have doubts, if that makes any sense. It makes me still wonder if, look, if it was all in my mind, then my mind is an incredible thing because it was realer than this. But I still have my doubts. Do you have do you still have any doubts about this stuff? Um, well, yes and no. I would say I know it's real, I'm, but I do get longings, and I'm like, gosh, you know, I haven't had a good out of body in a while. I've got to do this. I'm really feeling like, like I need that um, sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, but as far as like, no, I just have had too much. For, when someone dies, I'm like terribly it's upset. Yeah, but at the same time, I'm like geez, I know where they are. I bet I know what they're doing. I'm going to look for them. And uh, so it's kind of a different experience than it used to be when my mom died, for sure, which was real hard. And, yeah, uh, I bet. N now it's, there's not, you know, not that it's not hard, but there's a little bit of that blow is softened, I would put it that way. Yeah, I know in your book you described uh, that you found out that your mother had passed away via phone call and that's got to be hard you know and that um you kind of wondered why nobody talks about death and when your mother passed away that you finally realized why people don't really want to talk about it they don't they think about it in the back of their mind but it's not something they want to talk about and it yeah. might not be so much because they're afraid of it because when you lose somebody it's really damn hard you know yeah, it really is. And the problem is we all, we all lose somebody at some point. Pretty much everyone on earth has to go through this incredible loss. It's part of the whole earth lesson. Robert Monroe talked about how graduates of the earth school were well respected because it's a tough school. And God, I got to agree. It's not easy. Did you meet, do you think that we have a higher self though? Like, in the uh, books of the Golden Dawn and the Rosicrucians, they talk about a holy guardian angel. In the Eastern right. books, they talk about your higher self, you know, Padamata Satyas, Bodhisattvas, all these different levels of yourself. Robert Monroe talked about all these people that would, that he met, like he thought were guides that just helped him. But when you get into his third book, and I don't want to spoil anything, but he realized that those beings were other versions of himself or his higher self. Do you believe that we have a higher self, like an ultimate self? Yeah. You know, start to really look into, you start having serious questions about what identity is and individuality because you start learning about past lives and you're like, well, geez, what is this? Is this self? You know, who, who is this? How is this connected to me? And it's very strange. I've tried to like see my higher self. I'll call out, take me to my higher self. And it's had some unusual results that I don't understand. 
I mean, one time I was taken to see this lady, and I'm looking at her like, well, who are you? <laughs> are you, you are my higher self? Another you were a time, female? No, sh she was. Well, yeah, I guess me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, this lady, yeah, I'm like, huh. You know, and that, I'm like, well, this just does, doesn't seem right. And another time I'm like, take me to your higher self. And I'm in this hallway, and I'm like, it's got to be behind this door, I guess. This is all that's here, and I whip it open and it's a crowded room there's all kinds of neat stuff but i'm drawn to you know my brother and my sister-in-law who you know are probably some of my closest of all my siblings or were at that time certainly i'm like well you guys what are you doing here they don't remember anything of course but uh, i felt like it was really them so one time i'm like hey well let's try god you know i want to see god god himself why not and i'm like and i Popped yeah. out of body. I'm there in my living room. I'm like, take me to see God. Right. And That's a good one. Yeah. And this, yeah. Why not try it? Right. Yeah. <laughs> what happened? I was struck by this like thunderbolt of energy and it just whipped me up through the ceiling, you know, pretty violently. And uh, that's all I remember, except coming back the next morning feeling like light, like I could levitate, just really good. Like I was in a place. That just left me so happy. I um, wish I could remember what actually happened, but I just can't. I just didn't. But you don't remember meeting God. You no, just remember I, how you felt, right? I, I feel like it's got to have happened because I was like bursting with light. I was just, you know, it's just a kind of a, a really good mood that you almost never get when you're down here on earth or, because there's always something bothering you, you know, whether it's, you know, a problem with your leg or a bill or a relationship that you're working on or whatever, car problems. There's always something. Um, just didn't matter. It didn't matter. This was a connection that I felt that, you know, I often feel after coming back from a really good out-of-body experience, like what really matters is, you know, loving each other, learning, experience, facing your fears, realizing your goals, and, you know, sharing and just, really having a good time with life. That's what really matters. Yeah. You know, I often hear, uh, that, uh, the earth is, uh, slavery, right. And that life is a prison. And yet, uh, based on a lot of the books I've read and the experiences I've had that life is a gift. It's really just a perception thing or that we just kind of make this our own prison. And I mean, things are tough, but it's how we deal with it. You know, um, and I believe yeah. if everybody, another reason why I really want everyone to attempt this, especially people that are interested in it, skeptical about it, not sure, is because I think, based on uh, Robert Monroe's third book, I think that if everyone realized that this was real, we actually could, and I know this sounds woo-woo or whatever, but we could change this place. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Love is the answer for sure. We could all come together. There would be no problems with you know environment or economics or energy or all the you know politics that's going on. There's no reason for it. We're all one. We're all together. We all really want the same things. There's enough for everybody. It's just a matter of you know believing, I guess, in each other. I don't know. Well, the first thing like it would do it. is, even though lots of people say they know where they're going to go when they die, a lot of the people the reasons a lot of people get salvation is because they're afraid of damnation uh, or they're afraid that they're not going to go anywhere when they die or they pretend not to care, but in the back way deep in their mind, they care. They just don't want to talk about it because it's not fun to talk about death. But what if everybody knew that it was an illusion that you really didn't die? I think that would change everything. And nobody convinced me more about that than William Buellman when he was talking about how he finally realized for once he had no doubts that there was something after this. And he created a, um, a system to help people that were on their deathbeds, um, people that were in uh, hospice, um, and he would show them and guide them to have out-of-body experiences and prep them for death. And some of the stories in those books about how they weren't scared anymore because William had helped them go out of body. Uh, 
all the spiritual books, whether they're Buddhist books, Christian books, where you have apostles and uh, prophets and whoever saying, you know, they left their body or they saw this vision, but they don't know if they were out of their body or not, which inclines me to think that people were doing it way back then too. And not at the very least, not to mention the whole reason why I created lighting the void was because of my experience. If anybody's got any doubts and you're thinking about it, I'll say this one last time, just like Preston says, get the books, try it, and then get back to me. There's nothing yeah, other to say than that, right? You know, I, cu- I couldn't agree more. I mean, just give it, give it a try. Write down your dreams for a month. You know, really try to remember everything that's happening to you at night. There's no reason for you to lose consciousness for eight hours. You can basically, you know, add one third to your lifespan and have all manners of really wonderful experiences by just becoming conscious of what you do at night. Do you know when the last time you had an out-of-body experience was, Preston? Uh, just, you know, a c- couple of days ago, I was telling you earlier, I think during one of the breaks, I was popped out of body and it slipped into a lucid dream. Oh, but you I saw tried, the dragon? You know? Yeah. <laughs> it, was, you know, it was great. I'm like, out-of-body, I made it. And I, but I, everything was a little cloudy. And I'm like, push, I'm like, clarity, clarity, raise awareness, raise awareness. And I pushed, pushed, pushed. Until I made it now. So oh, here I am in my backyard, totally awake, but got distracted by you know, something in the sky that came swooping down, and it was a darn dragon, which tried to bite my head off and uh, scared the living daylights out of me. And it was, you know, really weird because it was very vivid. And, you know, I mean, you're awake. So this is like hard to describe to people. They think, oh, it's a dream, it's a dream. I'm like, well, no, it's not really. I mean, even if it is a dream, you're awake in it. It's more like a video game, maybe. That you uh, have a part of creating, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like you're within a movie, it feels utterly real. So you see these things happening to you, and like, whoa, this is crazy. I have the out-of-body experiences pretty regularly, and it goes in kind of waves. I'll have none for a couple of months. Then there'll be a couple of months where I'm like, Gosh, I'm having them, not nightly maybe, but like every weekend and some really good ones. But generally speaking, just a couple per month maybe. Mm-hmm. Well, listen, not- yeah, that's, you know, we got to get out of here, but thank you so much for finally doing this. I know we had talked about it for a while. I've talked to just about everybody in this field uh, when it comes to the out-of-body experience from scientists to authors and i uh, you know, we've been meaning to do it for a while and we finally got to do it. Make sure that you go to Preston Dennett Weebly dot com. Is there another any other uh links you want to give out, Preston, before we get out of here? Uh, nope, that's it. Or you can contact me on Facebook. I always love to hear from people, whether they've got a you know, question, a comment, or a story they want to share. Always interested to hear from people. All right. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show again. I can't wait to have you back on when you get some more books coming out. Preston Dennett, everybody, check it out. PrestonDennett.Weebly.com. And uh, also check them out on social media. And thanks again, Preston. Hey, my pleasure. Anytime. Uh, we got to get out of here, guys. Don't forget tomorrow night we're going to have on Costa McCrease. Via your request, we're going to talk about uh, the People's Disclosure Movement and uh, the CE5 events, the things known as uh, CE5 events. I guess how to communicate with uh, beings from uh, other planets, possibly other realms. It's going to be a good one, so make sure you come tomorrow night. And this show was produced by The Fringe FM. It cannot be rebroadcast or syndicated without written permission. And intro music was by Kronoks. And, uh, you know, the guitar man was by Bundy. And uh, other music was by Space Station. I can't think of them all. Kevin McLeod. But we got to get out of here. We'll see you guys tomorrow night. Good night.
thoughts and opinions expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect those of the Fringe FM, KTLK Digital Broadcasting, its sponsors, affiliates, or staff. Listener discretion is advised. We told you weeknights on the Fringe FM are now even better. And we mean it. Do it live! Where else can you hear the best shows and the best talent? Kick off your evening with our newest host, Alex Exum, live at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 Eastern. Hang out with me, Joe Roop, on Lighting the Void at 9 Pacific, Midnight Eastern. Ryan Gable expands your mind on the secret teachings at Midnight Pacific, 3 a.m. Eastern. We're bringing the heat every single night. Fire it up. The Fringe FM. Yahoy there. This is Gigi from Shift Happens. And holy shit, you're listening to KTLK, The Fringe FM. Hey, hey, don't you dare turn that stupid music. 